This is Mind Pump. Today's episode, we had a lot of fun. We talked to a retired Navy SEAL, Dr. Kirk Parsley. He's an expert on sleep, expert on longevity, hormone therapy. He wrote a book, it's an incredible book, called Sleep to Win, how Navy SEALs and other high performers stay on top. By the way, you can find him on Instagram, at Kirk Parsley. So it's at K-I-R-K-P-A-R-S-L-E-Y. You'll find it uh, on Instagram. All right, today's giveaway here on YouTube is Maps Anabolic Advanced. Here's how you can win that. Leave a comment below this video, the first 24 hours that we drop it. Make sure to subscribe to our channel and turn on notifications. Do all those things and that'll enter you to win Maps Anabolic Advanced. Also, we're running a sale this month. It's January, so a lot of people are just getting started or getting remotivated or ready to turn up the intensity. Check this out. We put together four workout program bundles and we discounted them. Ready for this? Between $300 to $350 off. Massive discounts. Check them out. New to weightlifting bundle, the body transformation bundle, the new year extreme intensity bundle, and the body transformation bundle 2.0. You can find all of those by clicking on the link at the top of the description below. All right, here comes the show. Dr. Kirk Parsley, great to meet you. We have a lot of common friends that speak so highly of you. Uh, Rob Wolf talked very highly of you, Dr. Gabrielle Lyon. So it's, it's awesome I, to have I you I bribe on. him. <laughs> 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 or threaten him. I don't know. Freak, I didn't realize you were as big as you were. You walked in. Like, this guy, <laughs> what's going on? A mean handshake. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, tell our audience a little bit about your background yeah. um, and, you know, kind of take us up to speed to what you do now. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I... Uh, I was raised in sort of rural Texas, um, hated school, but I, I loved uh, athletics and I loved fighting. Right, maybe not the best thing, but um, I, you know, competed in a lot of sports and I was, a, I was a pretty good athlete, terrible student. So after four years of high school, I was a sophomore and uh, <laughs> I always knew I was going to go in the military anyway. So I just like, you know, when all my friends graduated, I just, I just left the military. Um, Again, I was a really naive kid, didn't read a lot, didn't like, didn't understand a lot. Um, and so I didn't even know what a SEAL was, but there's this documentary that came out in uh, December, <clears throat> uh, December of 87. Uh, it's like 48 hours. You remember that? Yeah. It's kind of like mm -hmm. 60 minutes. But, and so they covered the first 48 hours of Hell Week and SEAL training. And they kept saying, oh, this is the toughest training in the world, toughest training in the world. And I was like, well, I want to go do the toughest training in the world. <laughs> I didn't even know what a SEAL was, but I wanted to go to that training, right? Um, was this the first like big exposure to SEAL training? Because I, I know it, before that, if you saw anything in a movie, they would talk about Green Berets. Yeah. And no, then, nobody knew what a SEAL was. Yeah. Okay. In fact, when, when I came back uh, and saw my friends after I'd been in the Navy for a while, and I'd say as a SEAL, and they're so confused. They're, okay. You work at SeaWorld? Like, what is, what is <laughs> SeaWorld? I'm like, <laughs> make the noise. Make the noise. I'm sure I do. Yeah. I'm familiar. Um, yeah. So, so I watched that VHS. Remember those days? Yeah. So the big yeah. uh, rewound that thing. Watched that thing about twenty times in a couple of weeks, and I was just like, I was only seventeen at the time, but I said, told my mom I wanted to go do it, uh, and and I was always going to go in the military. Like I always knew that, um, and so went and joined it to be a SEAL. Uh, so I'm so naive, I didn't even know I was going to get paid uh, to be in the military, uh, which. You're like, this is a bonus. <laughs> some like seal, uh, some dive motivator and uh, and boot camp figured out that I didn't know that and like took me around to every office and like made me tell them the story. I was like, <laughs> hey man, they're gonna feed me. They're gonna give me clothes. They're gonna like I'm gonna be trained. Like, what do I need? Right, I'm gonna live in the barracks. Like, what do I need money for? Like, why, I, I never occurred to me they were gonna pay me. Um, <laughs> and so anyway, they uh, loved you because of that. I'm yeah. sure. Yeah, <laughs> promote this guy. Yeah, yeah. Real, real expectations. So uh, so then I ended up. Um, you know, th there were some academics and and boot camp, and then you go to what we call A school or apprenticeship school in the Navy, because you have to have some sort of job. Mm -hmm. um, because ninety percent of people fail SEAL training, so they have to some they have to have a place to send you when you don't make it. Um, so that was about nine months, and that was all academic. Um, and then I went to Buds, and there was a lot of academics in there, and I actually did really well academically. I was like top one or two guys in everything I did. So I was like, oh, maybe I'm not dumb, you know. Mm -hmm. I don't know, but I, I still sealed doing a seal thing. And what then, do you attribute that to? Like the fact that you yeah, were so anti-school. Uh, well, um, like I, I, I don't, I don't know if it's technically dyslexia, but I have a really hard time reading. Like mm -hmm. it's, and I always have. Um, it, to this day, it'll take me three weeks to read a book that 
my wife could read in two days. I mean, yeah. I'm just, I'm just a slow reader. Um, and, uh, you know, and I had a really bad home life. Like I, my mom had remarried. I had a really abusive stepfather. The cops were at the house all the time. We were always fleeing town and going to live with her sister or something, you know, like, so it's kind of like a, just a crappy home life, not a lot of sleep, no one nourishing me, nobody making sure I did my homework, all that stuff. And so I started doing bad in school really early. And once you get behind, it's way harder to catch up. And then yeah. you build this narrative about yourself. Yeah. I must suck at school. Yeah. And my, hmm. and my stepfather's telling me I'm stupid. I had teachers telling me I'm stupid. Like hmm. in third grade, hmm. I had a teacher say, you're the dumbest student I've ever taught in wow. the whole classroom. Wow. Wow. Like, it's like, all right, well, teachers were hardcore. And I was, I was, like, like, realize that. I was like, well, I guess I'm dumb. So yeah, like, gosh, whatever, I better, I better be tough. If you're going to be dumb, you better be tough. Right. Um, and so I just drove everything towards the physical. Um, yeah, and, uh, anyway, I, you know, graduated through SEAL training, went to the SEAL teams. Um, you know, that was like the, the Clinton and then Bush era. So we had like, we had the Gulf war, but that was super limited, you know? Mm -hmm. And before that, it kind of seemed like, you know, when we, under Clinton, we were just kind of like the world's police force. Like we didn't really go to war and the Gulf war was such a joke. It was just kind of like, are we ever really going to get a war again? Mm -hmm. I mean, like, am I, am I just training over and over again, doing the same trip with different guys? And it's like, kind of like I've been there, done that. I'm going to go do something else. Um, and I didn't know what I was going to do, but I got out, um, you know, with the, with the, uh, encouragement of having done well academically in the military, uh, thought, well, you know, maybe I can, you know, I got to go to junior college cause I have a GED. I can't even get into college and started doing that and, uh, did really well in college. And, uh, you, you know, you have to have 2000 volunteer hours to even apply for PT school. And I thought I might be, want to be a physical therapist. Mm. So I started volunteering at San Diego sports medicine center. And then they hired me, um, as a PT aide, I became a PT assistant eventually. And I, I was really doing a PT's job and just decided I wasn't what I really wanted to do, but I became friends with the doctors there and they were like, Hey, you should go to medical school. <laughs> like, yeah, pump the brakes. Just I said, what a crazy turn of events <laughs> yeah, yeah. for a like, guy, on, a guy who thinks he's dumb <laughs> yeah, and yeah. also, I mean, that's yeah. wild. Yeah. And I'm like, I failed every grade since third grade. Eventually, <laughs> got pushed ahead. Like, I had good football coaches that got me, uh, you know, got me through the years. Um, and uh, anyway, so I said, uh, and so this doctor actually, this is a great story. Uh, the guy who owns it, Dr. Lee Rice, uh, he's still down in San Diego, and. Um, he hears the conversation with me and these younger doctors and he comes out and he says, Kirk, the question isn't, can you get into medical school? The question is, would you go if you could get in? I was like, hell yeah, I'd go. And he's like, kind of got to do it then, don't you? And I was like, oh yeah. So he kind of like shamed me into it. And so I said, all right, I'm going to go to medical school. Um, and then when I was applying for medical schools, you know, it's an impossible thing to get into medical school. I mean, there's so many really smart, talented kids that don't get in. Um, so they usually recommend you apply to about 20 schools and hoping that you get into two and you have mm -hmm. a choice. Um, so, you know, pre-internet, you had to go to the bookstore and look through the Kaplan books and figure out your GPA and MCAT and how competitive you were. So I, yeah, I did all that and I uh, found out while I was doing that, that the military had their own medical school. Oh, and they would pay me to go to medical school instead of the other way around. And I was already married, already had a kid, had another kid on the way. I was like, it's kind of a no brainer, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Like I, so I mean, you don't get paid a lot, but I made enough to support my family when I went to medical school. My wife didn't have to work. Um, and then, uh, you know, the way the military works, they'll train you to do anything, but it's about a two to one. So you go to medical school for four years, you have to be a doctor for eight years. Uh, it's like your payback. Mm. And for uh, them. For them. Oh, I see how that yeah, works. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so, you know, that's what I did. And uh, I figured I'd get back to the SEAL teams as their doctor. And I did. And uh, Now, was this a general practitioner or? Well, so the way, the way the Navy works is you do your first year of residency, and then they send you out on what they call a fleet tour. And that's how they keep general practitioners because otherwise everybody would just specialize yeah. and then why are you going to send a neurosurgeon to like to take sure. care of sick call or whatever so um so that's kind of their game and you're out for like two to three years and then you come back to residency um and um like my whole career was building toward orthopedic surgeon and like that I, I, you know I, I obviously i did sports medicine the whole time i was in college i had six years of experience in that 
And then like, I just loved, I mean, I've always been mechanical and like good with tools and uh, carpentry and stuff like that. And orthopedic surgeons are carpenters. I mean, they really are. It's, it's mm-hmm. cutting and putting screws in and plates, yep. like whatever. So it's like, they're yeah. also the most fit doctors. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm like, <laughs> the I'm, like, doctors. I'm, like I'm, yeah. I'm designed for it. Well, you know, you think about it like orthopedic surgeons, people like me who their only exposure to doctors were injuries. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. The only time I ever seen a doctor is when I was hurt. Yep. Uh, and it's like, do you get surgery? You know, and that's kind of like all the doctors ever told me. I, throughout <laughs> my career, I've told this before, I've probably trained uh, as a personal trainer, but maybe 30 doctors yeah and uh i could always pick out the orthopedic surgeon yeah, and right. what, what why they work out yeah. almost every time yeah, they yeah. work out you yeah know? Yep. and they're usually athletes and that's yeah. usually their exposure so um so i you know i did my first year of residency and then um they send you out to the fleet but if you want to go out and do something other than just sit on a ship you can go to flight school and then you go work with pilots or you can go to dive school and you go work with divers and or seals mm-hmm. So I went to dive school, which had a hyperbaric, hyperbaric residency um, associated with that, and then went back to the SEAL teams as their doctor, thinking, here I am, I'm going to do all this sports medicine and orthopedic stuff, right? Not orthopedic, so I wasn't a surgeon yet, but, um, and I got there, you know, the long funding cycles in the military, right? Big bureaucracy. So it takes about 10 years to get the money for anything that you decide you want to do. Mm-hmm. And the money had just arrived to build the very first sports medicine facility that the West Coast Seals had ever had. Like we, people think we'd have all kinds of stuff. We, we had nothing. Like, um, and so we hired our first nutritionist and our first strength and conditioning coach and our first oh, wow. uh, athletic trainer and our first PT and our first PT assistant. Um, and they, and they, they put me in charge of, uh, this build out because I had a ton of experience with, um, rehab facilities already. And I got, you know, I was in charge of the build out and then I was uh, one of the people hiring all these people and we got great people, you know, cause the seals had this kind of celebrity status at that point. Like this is not that long after bin Laden. And, uh, so, uh, we were getting, you know, Olympic training center people and professional sports teams and, um, uh, you know, D1 college, uh, trainer, strength, conditioning, nutritionist, all that stuff. And then of course I was the dumbest guy in the room, right? Because we had like ortho rounds coming through and pain rounds coming through and a chiropractor coming through and acupuncture coming through. And then we had all these world-class people and doing what they're and, so when, and when you're the dumbest guy in the room in the military, they make you the leader. Right. So they're like, <laughs> <laughs> so like, all right, now you're in charge of supervising all these people. And I'm like, all right, I don't know how I'm going to supervise people that know all kinds of stuff. I don't know, but okay. And so my office was in the rehab facility and seals are, seals are a lot like, and I'm sure you guys know a lot of seals, but um, seals are a lot like professional athletes and that the worst thing you can do to them is put them on the bench. Like yeah. mm-hmm. they would rather, like cut their toe off and they, like right. easy exchange. Like they don't care. Um, and so they don't trust doctors. They don't trust the healthcare professionals because that's the most likely person to put them on the bench. So they don't tell, they lie to their doctors yeah. all oh, the I'm time. Fine. Yeah. It's mm-hmm. normal. They go in for the routine physical, everything great. Like, you know, they'll dope themselves up on whatever they need to do to be able to g- be good for that one hour visit. Um, and then they'll go out into town, pay out of their pocket and get treatment so that they aren't getting wow, uh, wow. put on the bench. Um, and they don't make a lot of money. So, like it's a big, it's a big financial strain for them. Um, but because I'd been a SEAL and because I'd been a SEAL recently enough to where there were still a ton of SEALs at the teams on the West Coast that I had trained with and deployed with, um, people trusted me. They trusted and they, you. They, they came tell you. in and closed the door and said, hey, let me tell you what's really going on with me. Um, and it's something that uh, I, I I dubbed the uh, – or is it dubbed, deemed, mm-hmm. or whatever. Yeah. I, called, <laughs> I called it uh, the SEAL syndrome uh, and then – some researchers, uh, I talked to a bunch of researchers and they reviewed my dad and did some of their own research. And now they've re they've re named it the operator syndrome. Um, and there's actually a book coming out on it. Um, but it's basically, it's all performance issues, right? So they complain their motivations down, their cognitive functions down, their memories down, their concentrations down, their body composition shifting poorly, even though they're working with the nutritionist, doing exactly what the strength and conditioning coach says. They're in pain all the time. Uh, you know, sex drive issues, sexual performance issues, um, emotional issues, like, you know, really short temper, snappy with their kids, um, poor sleep, but I didn't even pay attention to that. You know, and come from a community that selects for people who- Who can function with no sleep. Do well with yeah. no sleep. I mean, go through a week, you know, hell week without no sleep for a week. Um, and no one in the community thought much about it. Um, 
And I mean, these guys just came in one after another because it's like, you know, the community is all the word mouth. So, so this was like a cluster of symptoms you started to identify. Yeah. It's quite common. And, and I had no idea. I mean, zero idea. I was like, you know, I'm a Western trained physician. I know how to recognize and treat diseases. They don't have any diseases. They just aren't performing as well. Right. Like, what do I do with that? I don't know. Right. So I literally, every lab I knew how to interpret, I sent them to get. And so they're going over the hospital, pulling like 17 vials of drug of blood, 98 lab markers. These tests were costing about $3,500, which was one of the first things I got in trouble for. Um, Cause I'd spent like, you know, I'd sent a hundred guys to get thirty five hundred dollars tests, and uh, couldn't say exactly what I was looking for. Uh, but it came back, and like the operator syndrome, the the objective component of that is like really low anabolic markers, high catabolic markers, high inflammation, low insulin sensitivity. Like they look, their labs look like a fifty year old. 30 pound overweight pre-diabetic. So you're looking at uh, testosterone, free testosterone. You're looking at, I'm assuming growth hormone, cortisol. Yeah. Um, you know, insulin sensitivity, right? And then, yeah. the, and then the inflammatory markers. Yeah. Is that, did I and, nail them? And DHEA and pregnenolone okay. and sex hormone binding globulin, you know, okay. to, to um, all of that. And then- And then you saw some patterns. And I saw, I see these patterns. And they had already known that uh, the testosterone was, seemed to be low in SEALs. Um, after they've been in the SEAL teams a while. And then uh, the leadership just dismissed it. So the, those are guys that just abuse, abuse steroids and now they now they have this problem. And I was like, that doesn't make any, that doesn't even make any sense. Like yeah. they abused steroids 10 years ago. <laughs> like they're not gonna have any problems right now, right? right? Uh, and they were, they were young if, if they were doing it. But, but plus these guys trusted me 100% and they told me if they took steroids. Right. And very, very few of them had. And if they did, they took them for, two months here and there, like three or four times over their careers. Like they didn't, they didn't shut down their HPTA access. So that was stupid. Um, and anyway, you know, I was thinking, well, I'd heard of like shell shock and combat fatigue from yep. like other wars. I'm like, well, maybe it's something like that, which turns out nobody knows what the hell that is either. So like you go back <laughs> yeah. and read through it, it's just like the cluster of symptoms that nobody ever figured out what caused them. I'm like, all right, well, that doesn't help a whole lot. Um, uh, adrenal fatigue was kind of like this new buzzword yep. that was coming up. And I was like, well, that kind of sounds like it. Like, let me check out this adrenal fatigue. And the, the benefit that I had is that I was, I was the doctor for the West coast SEAL teams and I could call up anybody and say, Hey, I saw your Ted talk. I read your book. I heard your oh, lecture. Right. I'm the doctor for the West coast SEAL teams. Could so I talk to you? Can I come train That's with cool. you? Can I consult with you? And lots of doctors are like, bring me into their clinic for a week and like, let me see patients with them and show me. That's cool. Um, I just want to comment on, on just how great this is because uh, adrenal fatigue, uh, highly, the, the, the term adrenal fatigue, highly criticized uh, by Western medicine for a long time. Yeah. Mainly because the explanation wellness practitioners had was that your adrenals are fatigued and they're like, right. that's not what's happening. So the whole thing doesn't exist. Now we call it, what do we call it? HPTA access yeah. dysfunction. Yeah. Um, so it's the symptoms were there though and they're yeah. real and they're related right. to the hormones. Right. Yeah. yeah. It, was just, it was just misnamed. Uh, okay. Misnamed. Um, yeah. So I went down that for a while. I was doing, you know, Myers cocktails and adaptogens and, uh, you know, doing cortisol tapers, Cortef tapers on people to like try to improve that. I was having some success, not a lot. That was also kind of the big boom days, 2008, 2009 of uh, vitamin D3 was like the magic thing that everybody right. was missing and that affects sleep. And um, anyway, back up a bit, uh, probably 40 or 50 guys into it. I'm, I don't know exactly, but I'm, I'm embarrassed to say it was a long time uh, after guys had been coming to my office and talking to me that somebody said something about taking Ambien. And I just, rem like, I can remember so clear. So one of those moments where you can just like picture yourself and I exactly where I was sitting. And I was like, huh. And I make a note in the margin. And it like, seems like a lot of guys have said that. And then when he left, I went through my files and every single guy in my office had been on Ambien. Oh, wow. And I was like, huh, hmm. I wonder. So uh, now I went to Western medical school I didn't have a single class on sleep. I didn't know any more about sleep than the SEALs knew about sleep or the my gardener knew about sleep. And I, I feel like the typical uh, doctor uh, would look at that and think that the association was that the Ambien was causing the issues, but you thought it was more about why they use the Ambien? Well, or do you think you didn't know? Let me see. I, I didn't know because I didn't really know what happened when you slept, right? I just knew you, like, I, didn't, I was never taught, mm -hmm. you know, about stages of sleep and hormone you know, re reallocation and, you know, the glymphatics wasn't even known yet. And like, there's all sorts of stuff. I didn't, I didn't know anything about sleep. And so I didn't know, I mean, I, I'd taken pharmacology in medical school. So I knew that 
Ambien was a GABA at analog, but I was like, I don't really know how GABA affects sleep, so that doesn't help a whole lot. Um, but uh, yeah, the big problem, and one of the biggest problems in healthcare, probably the biggest problem in healthcare, is that the the pharmaceutical industry owns the data, mm-hmm. right? So when they do the research, they give the FDA what they want to give them. They hold on to what they don't <laughs> want to give them uh, to, to present the best case for them to get their their drug approved. But if they get sued, they have to lift up the kimono and show everything. So they had just been sued um, successfully multiple times uh, because Ambien dissociates your brain. So it's like dissociates the neocortex from the lizard brain underneath it. And now you're just running around on the lizard brain, which is the four Fs, right? The feeding, fighting, fleeing, and fornicating, we'll say. Um, And so you do those those four things and you, you aren't processing it cognitively. So you aren't getting any memory storage. And so people were getting in their cars, going to casinos, gambling their life savings away, mortgaging their houses and like all this stuff, picking up prostitutes. A big thing is eating. Like people just go downstairs and like eat all their kids' cupcakes and ice cream or whatever, and then come down the next day and be like yelling at their kids. What are you doing? You know, literally, like, literally amnesia from those events. No memory whatsoever. So, so what's happening uh, is that not only are they not remembering, but because the executive functioning is disassociated, you basically act on impulse. Yeah. So there's no control. You're acting primal. That's right? so wild. You're unlocking something for me that I I had a client for the longest time that I couldn't get to the bottom of why he couldn't control that. We got to the point where we talked about locking the refrigerator and and he was all on Ambien. I didn't even realize. Yeah. Yeah. It didn't even dawn on me back then. Yeah. Wow. That's so interesting. And so then once once you really dig in the Ambien literature, it sucks. The drug doesn't even work. Um, you fall asleep on average 13 minutes faster, sleep 37 minutes longer, but it decreases REM sleep by 80% and deep Oof. sleep by 20%. And if you take it with alcohol, like most SEALs did, alcohol does the opposite, decreases deep sleep by 80% and REM sleep. So you do a sleep study on those guys, it's 99.9% stage two sleep. So they aren't getting any sleep. Oh, wow. wow. Um, just this, enough to survive. Right. And and they're just surviving. And so, you know, the whole, the whole idea of being asleep is that the neocortex is slowed down. Like everything still works, right? All your... I mean, you can still move, your eyes still work, your ears still work, like everything's still working, just you aren't paying attention to it, you aren't processing it. And that's what GABA does, it slows down the neocortex. Well, Ambien binds a GABA receptor and has 1,000 times that effect of GABA. So you just completely shut the neocortex off. And then that just leaves you with the lizard brain, which is what, you know, not to get political, but which is what the Hamas guys were. Like, they were all out on drugs and they were over there like just acting crazy doing what like that's that's what animals do right mm-hmm. like that's animal behavior and that's what the lizard brain was um and so anyway they had been sued and so i started learning a lot about sleep because i could talk to all these smart docs about it and train with people um and then after i learned enough about that and what ambient did i thought well jesus this could literally explain every single symptom that they've complained of now I didn't think it would like that, you know, that that'd be naive to think that it would, but it could. So I didn't know how big that would affect would be, but I'm like, first thing we're going to do is get everybody off of Ambien, see what happens from there. Uh, expecting a marginal increase. And it was a profound increase. Right. Wow. So, um, I, I, I came up with like, with the help of the seals, like, you know, I, I went through and did the literature research on like, like, and I don't know about herbs and, you know, there's other things I think that help, but as far as just like nutritional, truly nutritional supplements, things that are usually in your body that are already in there, they're in your food. Um, I just made a list of all the things that are associated with sleep. And so you know, when you said increase going off ambient, do you mean increase in the anabolic hormones, changing the profile? Yeah, I'll, I'll get to that. Second. Okay. So, um, so I got. So I came up with a concoction of like seven different supplements. This is a pre-Amazon day. So I was just giving guys handouts and they were going around to the health food stores and buying all these Magnesium, supplements. Magnesium, vitamin D, stuff like Yeah, yeah. And so the whole the whole melatonin production pathway from, from tryptophan to melatonin and vitamin D3, uh, magnesium, um, and, uh, and GABA. And then I, I had them taking this and then they fed back to me. They're great patients. They're super motivated. They'll journal, they'll log, they'll come in and tell you every day that, you know, they're, they're not trying to uh, make you feel good about yourself. They're just going to tell you exactly what's going on. So we ramped up really quick, came up with a concoction that worked uh, and got all these dudes off of Ambien. Cause I couldn't just say quit taking Ambien. Yeah, cause like I had to come up with, up like they weren't there. sleeping yet. Right. So I had to come up with something. And so they started doing that within, you know, it, it varied, but it, let's say four to eight weeks, uh, 
total testosterone would double or triple. Free wow. testosterone would triple, quadruple. Wow. Uh, HSCRP would go from like 3.8 down to unmeasurable. Homocysteine would come crashing down. Fasting or AM cortisol would be way down. Insulin sensitivity would be way up. They'd go from a fasting insulin of 12 down to a five or six or something. <laughs> they weren't doing anything differently. Um, I had 45 year old guys PRing and they're CrossFit and they're mm -hmm. <laughs> jujitsu and they're running and they're triathlons, like whatever they did. Um, and, uh, and it was all happening, you know, off of their own accord, like their body was doing everything. Now it, it wasn't just that I was giving them DHEA as a, as a supplement for production of, you know, production pathway. And I was giving them a zinc citrate and occasionally I'd give them a, a Remedex to block the estrogen mm -hmm, conversion. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, just had these amazing results. And it was, you know, it was probably the 80% solution for 80% of the guys. Um, but they loved it. I mean, like 80%, most guys will take 80%. Like, hey, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the piece that I didn't figure out until like maybe the last year I was there was the TBI component, mm -hmm. which is the definitely the other 20%. And some people that's like 40% of it because TBI affects your hormone production what is as that? well. That traumatic brain injuries. Oh. Oh, oh, okay. So we used to think that you had to, like when I went through medical school, in order to have a traumatic brain injury, you have to have been hit in the head and you have to go unconscious. And if you don't meet those two criteria, you don't have a TBI. Right. Um, well, research was done uh, through Harvard and Oxford that showed through the, what's called DTIs, these uh, imaging studies. They can see a single neuronal tract breaking and they could consistently get a neuronal tract to break at 1.09 Gs, which they were getting from the acceleration changes on a roller coaster. So what? then you can imagine like how how much more people get. Now that would be an insignificant sure. one, but, and then we started studying these over uh, overpressurization from blast injuries, which just kind of rock your world. Like, you know, but you're in the room with it and this happens all the time. You throw a flash ring in the room, you come in and you start shooting in a concrete room, like, I mean, you're getting blast yeah. injuries. Like it's like that's going through your skull and everything and your your brain is vibrating and the blood vessels vibrate at a different rate than the dura and that vibrates at a different rate than the gray matter and that vibrates at a different rate than the white matter and it shears across all so these spaces damage. and it causes brain damage. And brain damage leads to brain inflammation and brain inflammation interferes with hormone production um, and in, interferes with sleep and cognition and all sorts of other stuff. So I, I didn't figure that part out till the, till the end. Uh, but as we were talking about earlier, we had these pre and post retreats where we would take the whole teams and kind of prepare them and their families for their deployment and then help them reintegrate when they came back. And we'd bring in speakers and I, and they started letting me speak to the SEALs about, and I, I just used the buzz terms they cared about, right? It's like growth hormone, testosterone, yeah. <laughs> like IGF-1, like you're going to get muscle, you're better erection, like, you know, all the stuff that they would care about. And I started shifting the culture. Um, the leadership bought on and we started changing like the sleeping environment at training facilities and all that other stuff and put scheduling naps in the middle of long training days and things like that. Um, and had, you know, we had some tremendous success. Uh, but then when I got out of the Navy, I kind of left a vacuum <laughs> right there, right? Because they were just going to replace me. And, and I didn't mention that it, I, I was fought by the bureaucracy the entire time. I mean, oh, I was mm. like, my medical credentials were su suspended almost half the time I was there because wow. I was always under investigation for practicing outside of my scope. Mm. Like giving Myers cocktails is beyond my scope. As a doctor, I'm not allowed to give vitamin IVs, I guess. So what's in a Myers cocktail again? Uh, magnesium, a lot of B vitamins, okay. um, vitamin C. Like it, Don't they call this like the hangover IV? Is that the way? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 it's really good for adrenal support and kind mm -hmm. of calming, calming things down because it has a ton of magnesium in it. Um, and uh, anyway, so, uh, you know, I left this vacuum when I left and uh, all the seals kept calling me, <laughs> you know, and they're like, Hey, you know, like we just got some Joe Blow here who like wants to give me Motrin and, you know, talking about my, you know, cold and my knee or whatever. Like we need, we need some, and I couldn't really do anything officially. So I just started seeing all these guys for free, uh, cause they can't afford any, anything. Um, and I was, I had a brick and mortar private practice with that Dr. Lee Rice who, t who guilted me into trying, mm. he had a concierge practice that I joined and was supposed to be his successor. Uh, and then I just got harangued so often and they're like, can you just make a product out of all these supplements? Because we're having to go to five different stores and buy all this crap. And this is in pills and that's in liquids and that's in powders. And like, we got to travel, like it's ridiculous. And so 
I was like, all right. Um, and then I was good friends with Peter T at the time we were talking about doing a consulting business together. And I said, Hey, I'm, I'll catch up with you in a year. I'm going to step out of brick and mortar. I'm going to make this supplement so that I can sell it to the SEAL teams and just make it like a super durable thing. I'll get that out for them. And then, uh, I'll just live off of my consulting. And, uh, when I, when I took consulting clients, I said, Hey, I charge a lot of money, but primarily I charge a lot of money because you're paying for seals because I'm, I'm spending half my time with paid clients and half my time with people who can't afford me. Um, and so that was my career. And because guys like Rob Wolf had brought me on in his podcast and I'd gone to lots of symposiums invited by all these kind of guys that we shared, I shared the stage with at those pre and post retreats. Um, you know, I, I had like a fl- I already had like a flood of, uh, people who wanted to work with me. Um, and I, I forget what I was calling it back then. It's bounced around holistic medicine, integrative functional medicine, all this. I call it performance medicine. Now I, I don't mm-hmm. deal with the disease at all. Like, uh, all my clients now have a concierge doctor, uh, who handles all their medical stuff. Um, I help you perform better. And it, whether that's cognitive, emotional, physical strength, endurance, I don't care. Whatever you want to be better at, that's what I do. Now you're, you're talking about, um, you know, largely high performance, like, you know, 1%, right? Seals. And so someone listening right now, average person might be like, well, I don't know if that applies to me. Like how, how big of an issue is poor sleep with the average person? Right. And, and what are those impacts having on the average person? Well, um, so I, I, I think probably kind of the best sales pitch I have is that, um, you know, th- SEALs are arguably the most performant group of men in the world. Um, one of the top couple for sure. Um, and so if chaotic and poor sleep can break these guys, it can break you. Mm. Um, and if I can help them perform at their level, I can help you perform at your level. Like my private clients aren't elite athletes. I mean, some of them are rarely, they're mainly 45 to 55 year old men who traded their health for wealth for 20 or 30 years. Mm. Now they have a ton of money and they're fat, out of shape, mm-hmm. worried about, you know, their brother had a heart attack or they're worried about playing with their kids, you know, their kids or their grandkids or whatever. And now they just like, money's not an issue. Like, I want to be a D1 athlete again in a year. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> right, right. Right. Let's set some expectations, <laughs> you know, like pump the, you know, pump the brakes there. Uh, but, you know, that, that's my private clientele. And then most, most of the SEALs I see are retiring SEALs or guys getting out. Uh, and, and TBI is a m- much bigger component of it than I was treating back then. I do a lot with that now. Um, I want to so, ask you about that specifically, yeah. especially with athletes and, yeah. and maybe especially high contact athletes and yeah. football and all like, what are you seeing in terms of like the severity of that? Like what's the treatment look like with that? Well, so all of those things that I described, uh, that I called the seal syndrome now called the operator syndrome all of that can easily be attributed to TBI as well. So, yeah, you know, a lot of people, I mean, I've heard you guys talk, you're pretty smart, I'm sure you, you all know this, but a lot of people don't know that like 100% of your hormone regulation happens while you're asleep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And in the first two sleep cycles primarily, because it's happening during deep sleep, your neuroregulation of appetite, balance of all your anabolics, catabolics, your immune system, your, like, right? like the only time you're getting better at anything is while you're sleeping. That's, that's when you're improving. So if you aren't sleeping well, you aren't, you aren't re- like the whole reason I sleep tonight is to repair from today mm-hmm. and to prepare for tomorrow. Right. So I, I'm exhausting resources and I'm damaging myself. I have to fix the damage and replenish the resources. And if I could do that a hundred percent, I'd wake up the same every day and I'd never age. I'd be exactly the same every mm-hmm. day. Right. And when you're young, it's even better than that. Like you wake up better <laughs> and then you like 25 to 35, you maybe plateau. And then after that, you kind of, kind of waking up a little bit worse every day. Like it might be a thousandth of a percent worse, but right. But, uh, sleep interferes, uh, with all those hormone, poor sleep leads to all those hormone dysregulations, but brain inflammation looks almost identical. Um, and brain inflammation leads to poor sleep and poor sleep leads to Positive brain, feedback. brain inflammation. Yeah, cycle. Yeah. So there's a lot, there's lots of self licking ice cream cones in these cycles, man. Um, you know, like a s- simple example that, that I talk about all the time, you don't really have testosterone receptors in your brain, right? You have, a, you have very few hypothalamus almost, has almost none. And that's what's measuring how much testosterone you have. So 
how do we, how, your brain knows how much testosterone you have by how much estrogen you have. Uh -huh. And so if you're- By the way, this is how uh, selective estrogen receptor modulators raise testosterone. Right. They block the estrogen receptor. Your right. brain thinks you don't have enough testosterone. Right. And so the, fa the place where we, we men have the aromatase enzyme to convert testosterone to estrogen is in our subcutaneous fat, not non-mental fat, not brown fat, but like in the fat we don't like to see in the mirror. That's the fat on us that has- that aromatase enzyme. And so the fatter we get, the more estrogen we convert, the more estrogen that goes to our brain, the more our brain says, oh, we don't need testosterone. The luteinizing hormone goes down. Then you produce less testosterone. Get fatter. Now you get fatter. <laughs> <laughs> like in that, wow. like, and that's real, I've never heard someone explain it that way. That's really cool. There's half a dozen, mm -hmm. there's half a dozen systems like that, you know, um, like another one, the, the number one reason that people can't sleep, we call psychophysiologic insomnia. That means you can't sleep because you're worried about not being able to sleep. Mm -hmm. So it's just a stress issue. When you, like I said, I go to sleep tonight to repair and prepare for tomorrow. I'm going to, right, I'm going to flush that you've heard of the glymphatic system. I'm sure you're going to flush all the toxins out of my brain. I'm going to, you know, start rebuilding all the neurotransmitter, neuropeptide densities. I'm going to start Re, you know, rebuilding ATP in my brain, getting rid of adenosine, right? All that stuff I'm going to do neuroregulation of appetite, my testosterone growth hormone, thyroid hormone, like even insulin glucagon are being re, uh, rebalanced, leptin sensitivity, ghrelin sensitivity, all that's happening during deep sleep. REM sleep, I'm rehearsing every single thing that I've heard today. Whether you remember it or not, everything I heard, I'm gonna go over three or four times and I'm gonna determine if I think it's important or not. If I don't think it's important, I'm gonna prune it and I'm not gonna remember it anymore. If I think it's important, I'm gonna start connecting it to other information. Once I connect it to enough pieces of information, I can come at it from multiple ways. I form durable pathways. Now I actually know that. And now I can work with it and I can come up with creative ideas mm. of like how that might impact something else that I know about. Um, all that's going on during sleep. If you have anything wrong with your brain, if you have any, if you just don't sleep well, and one of the major reasons is stress hormones, stress hormone, the lowest stress hormones you'll have it like we all know the highest stress hormones, right? Fight or flight. Right. That's the highest maximum stress hormones you can produce. The absolute minimum is delta sleep, like slow wave sleep cycle, the lowest stress hormones you have in any 24 hour period. Fight or flight is 100% catabolic. You're superhuman in fight or flight. You can't run around like that because you will die. You will right. eat yourself it's in, like in 24 hours. Your car all the right. time. You're just running off of pure nitrous. Um, Deep sleep is the most anabolic time, almost 100% anabolic. You're fighting off infections with your immune system. You're repairing. Like we all know, you, you lift weights, you get weaker, right? Mm -hmm. If you go to the gym, you do anything worth doing, you're weaker when you leave. When do you get stronger? You get yeah. stronger when you sleep. When you sleep, your brain uses today as the template to say, okay, this is what we need to be better at tomorrow. Your brain and your body are the template for tomorrow to say, if I tried to, do, tried to lift more bench press than I could do today, uh, my brain's gonna, brain and body are gonna try to make me more able to do that tomorrow. I'm gonna try to repair as much as I can and make those muscles, those muscle fibers stronger, thicker. Um, endurance, I'm gonna increase mitochondrial density or you know mitochondrial efficiency or something like that. That's all happening while I'm asleep. If you put 20%, 30% more stress hormones in there, you do 20 to 30% less of that anabolic behavior. If you put somebody in a cave with artificial lighting, they had no no cues whatsoever to know what time of day it was. And you they're just turning on the lights when they think they should be awake. Your circadian rhythm is in men is slightly longer than 24 hours and women is slightly shorter. So you'll be in a week, you'll be seven or eight hours off, right? But if you're well if you're well sleep adapted, you'll still sleep about eight hours. You'll fall asleep and you'll wake up. No lights are waking you up, no sounds waking you up. They've done these studies many times, up. by the way. They're yeah, interesting. They, there's be, hundreds of these yeah. studies done. And what wakes you up? Cortisol wakes you up. So the contract you're born into, it takes eight hours to recover from being awake for 16 hours. Put all the butter in your coffee you want, wear blue blocking lenses, <laughs> use red lights, whatever. It still takes eight hours. Like there's nothing you can do about that. Can't get away from that. If you choose to sleep six hours, you've shortened it 25%. 25% means you're aging 25% faster, but it also means you're 25% less prepared. Tomorrow still comes at exactly the same time. Exactly the same time. You still have to do everything the next day that you were going to do if you slept eight hours. So how do you compensate? 
yeah. stimulants and increase stress hormones mm -hmm. right increase stress hormones get closer to fight or flight now you have higher stress hormones throughout the day i already said stress hormones are catabolic so you're beating yourself down a lot of people will go work out really hard in the morning like after they didn't get enough sleep and increase stress hormones more and like hurt themselves even more now they're trying to go to sleep and their stress hormones are too high to go to sleep yeah. but if they're exhausted enough they have enough adenosine they can pass out they go through one or two sleep cycles all the adenosine's flushed out neurotransmitters have replenished cortisol still there they wake up can't go back to sleep so brain uh brain injuries brain inflammations lead to that same that same type of pathway because your brain just simply isn't functioning right. With inflammation, the brain's inside of the skull. It compresses everything, puts pressures on things. And inflammatory and inflammatory products in the brain are kind of like oxidative and damaging. Are there are there specific things people with uh, these types of uh, you know TBI anything they can do to to help yeah, reduce brain inflammation? Yeah. Oh yeah. So there's tons of things. I uh, I do this all the time. This is one of the primary things I do with the seals now. Um, so. I did, I mean, I, I told you what it, how little it takes to get a brain injury. You're like, yeah. uh, 1.09 G's to create it, right? Uh, M4 fire inside of a concrete room is 35 G's, oh, right? And you have four guys doing it 10,000 times in a day. Uh, you know, our fast boats transit at 60 G's, peak over 100 G's. Our anti tank, anti armor, Carl Gustav. 200 G's when you fire it. The spotter gets 300 G's. Jeez. Uh, if you're in the back of a Humvee with a 50 cal going 65 G's for every round, <laughs> like every seal has thousands of brain <laughs> injuries <laughs> and like every military guy, but it's like yeah. the, really the biggest difference in special forces is like the higher you climb up that ladder, the more money you have and the more bullets you get to shoot and the more equipment you have, the more training trips you have. So they're more, there's just way more brain injuries, the higher you get up that echelon. Um, and so we work on things to decrease brain inflammation. So the first thing you have to do is get the hormones right. Um, and a lot of the times, uh, if people are young, I try to improve their hormones without giving them hormones. But if you have enough brain damage, that might not be possible. So I might have to actually give you hormones with the conservative pathway where I'm supporting your production, encouraging your own production. Um, and then two, three months later, we'll try to take the testosterone off. But if you're- so so they go with testosterone. You said conservative pathway to encourage their own. So you do what? Enclomiphene? Yeah, I do. Uh, Enclomiphene, uh, seven, seven keto DHEA because that can't aromatize. Got it. Uh, pregnenolone, um, an arom aromatase inhibitor. An aromatase inhibitor. Um, if their section one binding globulin is really high, I'll use a synthetic testosterone for like six weeks to drive that down mm. really low. Um, Secretagogue for IGF one if uh, you know for growth hormone mm -hmm. if that's one of their issues. Um, what is, a is there a way to screen for this, like an FMRI, or like how do you know you, other you can't, than feedback? You can't really study. Yeah. I mean, you can study with EEGs. Actually, one of the best treatments for, uh, and this is the reason this is so pos popular. Um, it it's obviously a uh, <laughs> touchy subject, uh, but psychedelics are probably like the best one time treatment. If you're just gonna, if I just had one day to do something with you, that's that's what I would do. They're huge, hugely anti inflammatory to the brain. Hmm. They also regenerate a ton of neurotransmitters and clean a lot of receptors, increase receptor density. Um, we can get amazing results. Um, see, I don't, I don't really believe that PT. Like anything with syndrome on it isn't or isn't real. It just means we there's a bunch of symptoms that we're seeing together all the time, like my seal syndrome or that the follow along syndrome. with each other. Like these are the typical things, but we can't explain them. That's why we're calling it a syndrome. Mm. So PTSD, I don't I don't believe it. And I think PTSD is a it's a conglomeration of symptoms that are caused by damaged brains. Um, and so the more brain damage you have, the more PTSD symptoms you have. The more brain damage you have, the harder it is to sleep. The harder it is to sleep, the more brain damage you'll have, the more brain inflammation. We we documented in the in the Navy almost in almost a one-to-one -one correlation between total testosterone and sleep. So it was it ended up being a 0.87 correlation, which nobody had published this before. Shocking to me, because I it seems hmm. pretty obvious. But if somebody has low testosterone, I guarantee you they don't sleep well. If somebody if somebody doesn't sleep well, I guarantee you they don't have good testosterone levels. If you sleep poorly and have low testosterone and I increase your testosterone, you'll sleep better. If you just sleep better on your own, your testosterone will go up on its own. Um, so like, you know, all, all, all of these things are, 
you know, completely intertwined mm. and every, every hormone affects every other hormone. You mentioned the psychedelics for the anti-inflammatory effect because the studies on that now is quite fascinating, but are these the natural like tryptamine based molecule, like psilocybin? psilocybin yeah. yeah. Okay. So the, the, they've done functional MRIs mm. with, um, a group. So, so ketamine isn't really DMT, but it's, it's very <coughs> similar. The molecule looks mm -hmm. very similar. 5-MD uh, or M MDMA is a completely different compound, but it has some similar effects. And, uh, then you have your DMT, your 5-MeO-DMT, psilocybin, ayahuasca, um, ibogaine, and then you know things like the mescalines and other cactus yeah. plants and things like that. They all work off of DMT. Dimethyltryptamine is, is the pathway. They all have their so, plants, so there's thousands of effects. Mm -hmm. But one of their primary components is that. Um what I talked about earlier about using str using stress hormones to compensate for not getting enough sleep. Now I can't sleep well because my stress hormones are too high. So when I don't get a good enough sleep, my next day my stress hormones will be even higher. So now my stress hormones are high because I can't sleep well and I can't sleep well because my stress mm -hmm. hormones are high and I get that same self-propagating downward spiral. So um, what did you say right before the, the Yeah, yeah. Those for anti yeah, yeah. So... Uh, stress hormones. Stress hormones are activating the amygdala, and the amygdala is activating stress hormones. Right. So the amygdala is like that little walnut on each side of your brain that's giving you your stress response, your vigilance. Um, so right now, sitting here, our, our amygdala tone should be really calm. Right. Mm -hmm. There's nothing threatening to us. There's not a lot of stuff moving around. Like we should be really calm. We aren't. Like almost certainly, we aren't just because of the world we've developed into. But people who have brain damage and people who have high stress hormones are even worse. What functional MRIs have shown with all those psychedelics is that they decrease amygdala tone by about 90%. Mm. And depending on which drug you're talking about, or plant medicine you're talking about, and theogen, uh, depending on which one you're talking about, the durability is different. So Ibogaine, that decrease in tone can last nine, nine months, maybe up to a wow. year. Um, ayahuasca is about six, three to six months. Psilocybin is like one to three months. Ketamine is like a couple of weeks to a month. MDMA is like just when you're taking it. And I don't know about the cactus derivatives. I, I don't think that was in the study. So if you think about it, um, what you guys do, what I do, and what all of these guys need is lifestyle modification, right? Mm -hmm. They need to change their life. They need to change how they think about things. The reason I'm a grumpy old man isn't because I'm 53 years old. It's because my brain is set in its pathways, right? I've gone through 50 years of REM sleep and I've formed all these durable pathways. And I have this idea that says, this is the way you do things. That's the way, this yeah. is the way you interpret that. That's the way you interpret this. This is what this means. That's what that means. It's a lifetime of experience. My neuroplasticity is very low. It's really hard for me to change anything about myself. My ego gets stronger as I get older because mm. I'm sh more sure of who I am. We call it confidence when we get older. Mm. It's like I know who I am and I know what I do and I don't do this and I don't and I do do. And so, if you want to, if you want to change how your brain is functioning, one, you have to have the stress out of the way because anytime you're stressed, your ego is protecting you, right? So these things decrease the stress hormones, decrease catabolic activity, and one of the biggest effects of, of stress hormones is it impairs the prefrontal cortex. The prefrontal cortex, as you know, is the executive functioning. It's our, it's our simulator. It allows us to go, hey, there's five different pathways. Let me imagine what would happen to each one of those five if I chose this. That's why these anxiety disorders, uh, you, your, your body kicks into anxiety before you can even process right. how to stop it. And then you fail yourself, right? If you're chronically sleep deprived or if you have... Mm -hmm. Uh, your brain trauma, brain inflammation, your prefrontal cortex doesn't work that well. This is what we call ADHD. Mm. ADHD and sleep deprivation are completely uh, inextricable. Like you look at the symptoms of those two in the yeah. DSM-4, you cannot tell those apart. Hmm. So it's the prefrontal cortex isn't functioning well. Uh, and that's because lack of sleep is a stressor because the only time any animal on this planet will sleep deprive itself is if it's starving or being preyed upon, like being stalked. So it's very reasonable to think that our brains evolve the same way. And so when we aren't sleeping well, that's another reason our stress hormones are higher. And our prefrontal cortex is 
is then going to be focused on stress. It's looking for things that are threatening to us and our functioning isn't nearly as well. Yeah. And so if I can decrease amygdala tone, now I have executive functioning to analyze my behavior and figure out if I want to do something different. But then the psychedelics have greatly increased my neuroplasticity because they increase BDNF and glial cell neurotropic factors. They increase, um, you know, uh, like HIF, they VEGF, so you're increasing your blood vessel flow, like uh, blood supply to your brain, and you're actually repairing your brain, and your brain is more plastic, like a little kid. The way that I've heard it explained hmm. to me was like uh, like tracks in the snow, and if yeah. you keep going down the same pathway, then you've got like this deep groove in the snow, yeah, and it's there, and uh, to get to develop a new track is going to be very difficult. Um, a great so- a great metaphor I've heard. I used to use like a rabbit trail to a super highway, but a great one I've heard that I think is really apropos. So you, you picture like uh, like an old you know seventeenth eighteenth century wagon with those tall wheels with the yeah. steel on them. Mm-hmm. And they go down dirt roads and they form these ruts, yeah. right? And then you try to if you've seen of one of those, yeah. you know, it's like the like the hump in the middle is like only inches under the middle of the wagon because yeah, the yeah. wheels are so deep in the rut. It's like now try to get out of that rut. Now try to go left or right. Yeah, ain't it's happening. Like, you're not getting out of that mm-hmm. run. So that, like that, that's a that's a good way to visualize it. But yeah, we, um, as we get older, you know, our hormones tend to decrease, diminish anyway. Um, we don't like most people aren't as active. They aren't in, you know they aren't as healthy. They aren't treating themselves as well metabolically. They aren't sleeping as well. Um, they have a lot more stresses, a lot more responsibilities in the world. Um, and it's just harder to change your brain. Psychedelics offer you an opportunity to that. There's peptides that do very similar things to psychedelics. Hyperbarics is an amazing tool, does mm-hmm. a lot of the same things. You can increase almost all, almost everything I just said there. Um, what are about, those peptides just to um, find out? Well, there, there's, lots of, there's lots of peptides that help. Cerebroliacin is probably the most powerful one. Mm-hmm. Uh, Cerebroliacin is a... It, it's a synthetic hormone or it's a synthetic peptide, but it has a bunch of um, uh, growth factors and neurotropic factors from uh, porcine from, from a pig's brain. Um, that has a that has about ninety percent of the same f- effect as psychedelics, but it's more durable. You do one. Uh, you do one 10 day treatment of that and that can last for up to two years. Oh, wow. um, it, in, it can improve your cognition, decrease anxiety, all that stuff. Mm. Uh, Epithalon can do the same thing. C-Max, Selenc, Selenc and C-Max are nasal sprays or injections. Um, yeah, they, I mean, they, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of, there's I've a read lot that of things. I've heard some of those. I've heard yeah. that BPC-157 can reduce inflammation B, overall. B, right? Yeah, BPC-157 uh, decreases inflammation and it can have, that can have some neurotropic effects mm-hmm. uh, because of inflammation affecting mm-hmm. the brain. Um, you know, what's interesting too about what you're saying about the psychedelics is that, because uh, people, we have a lot of studies now that are, I mean, what you're talking about is all backed by data. Yeah. The reason why we did those studies is very sad. It's because, first off, there's no profits. Very, You can't profit off psilocybin because it's not patented or DMT right. or whatever, right? Oh, they'll figure out a way to do well, that. Well, they'll try, they'll right? But, but this is one of the reasons why there wasn't a lot of studies on it. Um, ketamine, you know, very inexpensive. Right. Most compound right. pharmacies can make it. Right. But it was returning soldiers. Uh, they were, they were, suicide is now the top cause of death. And so military is really the reason they pushed us. We got to fund and figure out how the hell to deal with some of the stuff. Yes. That's why they started studying these. Yeah. So uh, in 2010, I got approached by Martin Polanco and his partner who owned Crossroads down in Mexico, which was an Ibogaine yeah, facility. That's right. Mm. And uh, it was called Crossroads because that's where Eric Clapton went after his son suicided. Mm. Um, yeah. And he donated his guitar collection to fund them, to keep them going because he had such a profound result. Um but their, the primary research at that time around uh, Ibogaine was opiate addiction. Yeah, heroin, particularly. Yeah. And so they came to me assuming my job with, with SEALs, I'd have a lot of people on opiates. We don't do opiates in the SEAL team. So like the, the other problem, like the other reason that I was so limited in what I could do with the SEAL teams is like, I can't put a SEAL on a prescription medication. Because if I do, it disqualifies him. Oh, because hmm. he can't be out in the field and not get his medication and be impaired. Right. So if you need if you need a medication, you can't be, you can't be in the field. So hmm. um, so I was having to do all of this without that. Um, but 
they wanted to talk to me about opiate addiction. I'm like, I don't really, I don't have that problem. We had a nice lunch anyway. I talked to them about their research and they said, well, you know, there's actually some research coming out that it helps with PTSD as well. And I said, okay, well, I might be interested in that. And so after my meeting, I went home, I looked at the sites, I looked at some of the research, the same two guys I was having lunch with were supervising um, a session, two different sessions where two guys had died under Ibogaine. And I was like, well, that's not super en encouraging. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure I'm too interested in that. So I just kind of put it off on the back burner. Um, and there's a, I don't want to take up your whole day, but uh, there, was, there was a SEAL before um, who I, I had treated who had been med boarded out. Um, it was on 13 different psychotropic medications, med boarded out, threw all his medication in the trash, got on a plane, flew to Peru, lived in the jungle with a shaman for 30 days, nude for reasons I don't understand, living off the land, doing kundalini yoga every day and uh, ayahuasca every third day. And he came back a completely transformed person. Wow. Um, and so that made me, th that's the only reason I even considered the psychedelics. Um, but anyway, that was on the back burner. A few months later, uh, my very best friend uh, in the world who I went through SEAL training with, we were roommates all through BUDS, um, his wife calls me and said, he's suicidal. He's kicked me and the kids out of the house. He's writing a suicide note. And I'm like, all right. So I go over to his house. Uh, one of the scariest nights of my life, he's threatening to shoot me and all this other stuff. And so anyway, we hashed this out over hours and I'm like, and like, he's not emotional. He's not drunk. He's not on drugs. He's like, he's just got, he's got this thing written out very matter of factly. This is why it's better for my wife. This is why it's better. Mm -hmm. for, this is why it's better for my kids. This is why it's better for these people. Um, and I'm just going to do it. And like, I'm ready. I'm ready to go. I was like, yeah, but none of us want you to die, dude. You know, it's like <laughs> that, that should be in there. Like mm -hmm. underneath every one of those, just be like, we don't want you dead. So I said, Hey, if you're going to kill yourself anyway, you know, this thing's dangerous and you might die, but at least it wouldn't be a suicide. So what do you say we go give this thing a try? And to Martin's credit, um, I rented out the entire clinic. He, uh, six bed facility. We just, we went by ourselves. We brought the guy who had, who had done the, the ayahuasca with us. Cause he was the only person I knew who knew anything about it. And, uh, he had this amazingly transformative, uh, wow. experience. I mean, the 18 year old kid that I knew that I met, came you out. know, came out the wow. next morning. And I was like, mm. wow. And then he had some friends who were really suffering and we got his friends treated and, uh, you know, we got five or six guys treated probably in like the next nine months. And one of those guys that we treated was Marcus uh, Capone, who then started vets, which is you know, the veteran seeking solution or veteran seeking mm. solutions, whatever. Um, and they have like that big organization now partnered with Stanford studying. I began, um, and, uh, and it, it's, it's just been exploding from there. And then there is, uh, I can't ever remember his last name, Nicholas, but he's a green beret. And he, uh, he had, I want to say he had a big experience with ayahuasca and he kind of started a nonprofit around that as well. So, you know, it, it's primarily been the special forces guys that have decided, like, we're not ready to go. We're not like, but, um, don't get me wrong. We have plenty of suicides, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's, there's guys who have enough wherewithal and resources and they, you know, they go do it. Like I see it all the time. Oh, <laughs> I have a guy for y'all's podcast. <laughs> this, the most amazing story I've ever heard in my life. Uh, I, I'm, it would take me an hour to tell it well, but basically this young kid, uh, Navy pilot ejected at the speed of sound while pulling four and a half G's, two and a half seconds before impact to the ocean and survived it. Uh, I mean, died a couple of times, but was revived, survived it. They said he's probably going to be a vegetable for the rest of his life. If he's not, he's definitely not walking. Two years later, he was flying jets again. Well, uh, but once he started flying jets again, all of his head injuries stuff manifested, and then he started having psychotic issues, and he got med boarded out. And at one point, he was a ward of the state in a psychiatric facility against his will, couldn't get out of it. Anyway, long, long convoluted story, but the most fascinating story I've ever heard in my life. Um, and uh, one of his friends said, hey, man, you should try psilocybin thing. I did it. He went and did psilocybin. He's never been on another psychiatric medication wow. for the rest of his life. He now does ultra mar like ultra marathon mountain bike races, whatever that is. You see the dude without a shirt on. I the looks, first the first study I read on, wow. uh, on psilocybin was something like that was with cluster headaches, people yeah. with severe cluster headaches. 
will do one dose and then not get one for like, not get a cluster headache for like a year. Yeah. And this is like an almost untreatable condition. People rip yeah. their hair out because it's yeah. so bad. I mean, does it piss you off because you're so close to so many of these people that suffer from stuff like this and then it's not, it's not widely accepted. It's still yeah. demonized. It's still, it's, unless you're in the know, so many people have no idea. Yeah. I mean, it, it's super frustrating. Um, you know, where, where I really get like my, my passion, like I said, I have private clients that, you know, that I, I like, and I'd love some of them. They become great friends. Um, but like my passion would be if I could treat every seal that's alive, that's what, that's what I would do. And the fact that I can help that community, you know, I can't help everybody, but if I can be impactful in that community, that community will expand and help a lot of other communities. And, you know, there's 10,000, there's 10,000 of us alive who've ever graduated seal training at like obviously some of those are dead, but 10,000 people total, whatever's left of that. If you could optimize that group of people and keep them connected. I mean, it's just um, like that. That's what gives me hope and ambition, you know, and, and uh, motivation every day. Uh, and, and I, and I try to educate other doctors, but doctors are kind of resilient or uh, resistant. Resi resistant. That's yeah. what I want. And kind of resistant to being told something by another doctor. Yeah, you of know? course. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, dude, I'm not trying to insult your intelligence. I, nothing, nothing I do, I learned in medical school. Yeah. Zero. I mean, it's a, lang a language yeah. school is all it is. Like, I, there's not a single thing that I do from day to day that has anything to do with my medical training. That's so crazy. At what, how yeah. far back um, did you get introduced to peptides first? And what, tell me about that journey, because this is something that we've been recently yeah. talking more about on our show in um, the last year or two. I mean, as, as far as like really understanding the breadth of them, like I think I've been, I was using Pentasan for probably 15 years, but uh, that, that's been around for a long time. Um, I heard about the first uh, secretagogues. Um, I didn't really use them, but I studied them and I knew some guys who used them, some colleagues, I talked to them about it. They, they weren't super impressive and that was maybe 10 years ago, but I'd say about um probably six or seven years ago, I really, I really got into studying them um, because I found out there were so many more than I, than I realized. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, Jesus Christ. And then, uh, and then I, and then I uh, started talking uh, to people who are really educated in it and found out, well, you know, Russia has been doing this since the eighties. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's thousands of research papers on all these things that we consider novel, you know, and my approach to medicine is like, you know, you, you guys know this as well as anybody. It's like, what what's the best way to eat, right? It's like, you know, keto, carnivore, paleo, like, a, you know, vegan, <laughs> you know, uh, I sh that showed bias. I shouldn't have laughed. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, so, you know, and, and you can, you can stack up convincing research on both sides of any issue. Right. Uh, and it, and it's, it's, I don't know, it, it's so damn frustrating. Thank, thankfully, you know, th thankfully sleep's not like that. Um, sleep's interesting because the, the best argument I've ever heard or, or maybe explanation of its importance I ever heard was that if sleep, if evolution could have gotten rid of it, it would have right by now. That's how important it is. I mean, yeah. you're, 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 you're totally unconscious. You're super vulnerable. You're not making shelter. You're not hunting. You're not getting resources. So if evolution could have figured out a way for us to like, Eventually, not sleep, but what of? I, I I think you heard that from me. Maybe <laughs> I started saying that in two thousand eight. It was, like, it was probably oh, yeah. I, I was like okay. I was like uh, I was like if you think about it, it's the most vulnerable time for a human being, yeah. and you go back evolutionarily when we didn't have houses and you know, brick walls and guns and stuff like that. It's like we were super super vulnerable at night. If we could have evolved to sleep four hours, that would have it would have favored those people would have procreated. What we ended up with is night owls and and uh, owls and larks right it's like um you have people who want to go to bed really late and get up a little later and you have people who want to go to bed really early and get up early well that cuts down like if it's a two-hour shift that cuts down four hours of the watch right so right. you have people you have people awake that's what two hours is. earlier into it and so like that's, still that's how we handle it so but it's still it's only four hours of like everybody being asleep and then you got <laughs> two hours on each side where you have like an, a, an alarm bell right so, um, yeah. So anyway, my, like my whole approach is like, we evolved to be on this planet. We evolved to eat a certain way, move a certain way, you know, think a certain way, like deal with a certain amount of stress. Um, and so when you have conflicting research, I just go for like, 
how do we evolve? Mm -hmm. Like what, like that's probably the best way, right? If, millions of years of evolution has led us like still on the same planet. You would think we would use the resources that are on this planet and try to try to mimic that as much as we can. So everything I do, I would, I would much rather just try to reapproximate youth, right? So you, you peak around 25 to 35. Mm -hmm. What do your hormones look like? What do your inflammatory cascades look like? Like what your, It's not what's a bad profile to use. Is it? It's like, I'm yeah. just going to use this. I'm not going to make you 25, but I'm going to make you metabolically, physiologically 25. If I handed your labs to somebody, they'd think you were 25. Yeah, well, peak results. fertility looks like essentially. Right. And so, we, and so we just, I move everything towards that. And peptides are already in your body, right? We're just like hyper-concentrating things that are already there. You know, it's just like, well, you know, you know, growth hormone breaks up into like seven different molecules and we can, t and well, this one really improves fatty acid oxidation. So we just need that one. If we want to increase a little, just put that mm -hmm. part in there. And so, you know, it's a, it's a little bit of trickery there, but I totally believe in just like eating the way we evolved to eat and moving and exercising the way that we evolved and sleeping the way we evolved to sleep and, you know, controlling our stress the best we can in this non ideal yeah. world. The big problem is that we, um, uh, our environment is, has changed far faster than we can evolve. Yeah, we so, can't evolve to keep up with it. No, no, because no. The, the search for shelter, the search for making life easy, that's all was all evolutionary beneficial up until we really figured things out and learned how to make things change really quick. Yeah, we hit some sort of watershed point. Where, I mean, you think about 200 years ago, life was about survival. Mm -hmm. And every year for millennia before that, it's like you got out of you got out of your cave, your little mud hut or whatever, got off your bed of straw. And like you went out and you procured few, few, uh, food, tried not to get killed, you know, uh, maybe, maybe get, have sex with your wife here now, now and then and reproduce like, and that was it. Like that was your life. And like there, there were male roles and female roles and every, and everybody had to do their job. And your goal was to make it till tomorrow. Yeah. And then at some point we, we got to this point where it's like, well, no, I'm going to live to be to 80 and I only have a 2000 square foot house. And my buddy's got a 5,000 square foot house. And I'd love to have a jacuzzi in my kitchen and like whatever. And you just start doing all kinds of stupid things, you know, and all those things are just adding stressors. And I remember uh, talking to my grandfather, my, 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 uh, I'm a, my, the production of uh, immigrants. So my, my family's very poor where they came from. I remember talking to my grandfather and he had, he's, he's like, so you go to the gym? I said, yeah. And he goes, so you just lift things and put them down? <laughs> he goes, for what? What are you building? <laughs> you know? And he, I remember him telling me, he says, you know, when I, you know, when I was growing up, he goes, if my, if someone said their knee hurt or their back hurt, it's because they worked too much. Right. He goes, you guys complain of this stuff because you don't do anything. Right. It's a totally different, totally yeah. different game now. Yeah. It's not because of overuse. It's, it's all because of underuse. You know, I want to ask you about hormones when you were talking about just kind of these, these, uh, positive feedback loops. And you mentioned the stress hormones. Insulin resistance is a real thing. And essentially it's your, your body's not responding to the insulin that you have. So your body has to produce more insulin to, cro to cause the same effect. And it eventually turns into something really bad. Mm -hmm. uh, I know with testosterone, with uh, high level, you know, athletes that use performance enhancing drugs, at some point you use so much testosterone receptors, maybe downregulate or whatever. Mm -hmm. Does that happen with stress hormones? In other words, can you develop something like cortisol resistance where, your body makes more cortisol to keep you more alert, but then that cortisol becomes less effective. So you got to make more cortisol to the point where you start to crash. Cause I know really, really bad uh, forms of HPA axis dysfunction look like extreme fatigue, can't move or whatever. You test their cortisol and it's like, is, is that a thing? Can yeah. that happen? So okay. every hormone in your body is that way. Um, most, most hormones, uh, anything that comes from cholesterol, which cortisol is one of those, um, most hormones can uh, diffuse into cells. They don't need a. They don't need a uh, cell uh, cellular membrane receptor. They just diffuse into the cell, and then there's there's a, a receptor within the cytosol of the cell that brings them to the nucleus uh, for the most part and affects epigenetic expression. Um, so any hormone that any hormone that I give you is going to downregulate your own production, mm -hmm. um, and then over time. If I'm super physiologic with it, I'm going to decrease my receptors. So, mm. if I like, if let's say, if I and, and this wouldn't be possible, but uh, let's say if I if I gave you melatonin and I gave you the ideal amount, which is what your brain was used to seeing all the time, and then really quickly I shut your own production off, 
And then you just had a normal amount of melatonin because I'm giving you the normal right. amount, but you just aren't producing any. Then you'd have normal receptors, but that's not that's not right. how hormones work because hormones are super pulsatile, and they're happening in tiny little fractions. Oh, there. Right. Like 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 a, a male's testicles produce like twenty to twenty five milligrams of testosterone per night. Right, like you don't you're not getting these big boluses, so you take an injection of two hundred milligrams. Well. Your brain and body have never seen 200 milligrams. They've seen 20 like at the right. peak, right? So now you get this super high level. That super high level, of course, leads to a huge flush over to estrogen, which is its own problem. But it also leads to downregulating of receptors because your your body's a super smart machine. If there's if there's a thousand testosterone molecules and I only need two or three, how many receptors do I need? Yeah. Not that many. But if there's only two testosterone mo molecules around, I'm going to have as many receptors as I can possibly make because like I will like each cell is its own thing. It's all trying to survive. In fact, they find, they find this in men as they get older, if they're healthy and they get older, you'll see some dips in testosterone, but you'll see an increase in androgen receptor density, almost yeah. like it's making up for it. Yeah. And you, and you can compensate for that. So you have two, you have two problems. If you go super physiologic, you're definitely wiping out decreasing uh, androgen receptors. Now you think about, Let's say if I if I give you a 200 milligram injection, that's 10 times more than your body would ordinarily see in that 24 hour period. So let's say I cut your I cut your uh, your testosterone receptors down, make the math easy. I cut them in half, mm -hmm. right? So now if you had a high normal testosterone level of a thousand nanograms per deciliter, um, you only have half the receptors. So you actually have a total testosterone now of 500. Yeah, effectively. Right. Effectively, yeah. that's all you have. And so when you do this big shot, you go, you go up and then you start coming back down. When you get to 1,000, you're deficient over time, right? Because you only you're, now you're like at 500. But those shots go like you go up to, you know, you go up to 2,000, you come down to 1,000, you come down to 500 before you do your next shot. So from 1,000 to 500, you're un, like you're underdosed, right? Wow. Um, and so, you, and that's because of receptor density right there. Now, there's other things that androgens are doing in your body. Uh, and so you, you're, you're definitely causing yourself harm because those things, like those, those androgens can go, like that testosterone can go into make DHT and that DHT can enlarge your prostate or cause you to go bald mm -hmm. or like, you know, uh, it affects cognition. There's all sorts of things you can do. So you don't want to like, you know, what bodybuilders and stuff like they go super physiologic and they take all kinds of stuff because they're trying to get this maximum amount of muscle growth in this very short period of time. And then they don't care what happens after the competition. Yeah. And then like, you know, they're ter obviously terribly unhealthy people. And and so everything I do, like I said, if I could get, if I could get somebody to do a testosterone injection every day, I would. I was just going to ask. So what yeah. do you recommend? I, I do it every other day. Do you do propionate? Hmm. Uh, Scipionate. So, so you still it's just do small doses yeah. then? It's super small. So it's uh, forty milligrams a day, or at forty milligrams every other day. And it was a sub Q or still in sub Q? Wow. Yeah. And then, oh, that's oil. So that doesn't yeah. leave a big ass lump in your. No. Now, if you use nandrolone, which I sometimes use nandrolone if people have a lot of joint pains because it helps a lot with joint yeah. pain. Um, if you just use nandrolone by itself, that does that doesn't do sub Q very well. That does cause okay. some problems. But if you mix it and do 50, 50 testosterone. Does so that thins it out a little bit? Or? It, it, I don't know. It has something to do with the molecule itself being irritating, I think. So it's um, Scipionate sub Q every other day. Every other day. And it has a long half-life, but still. Yeah. So what, what I'm trying to do is like maintain. So, and when I test people's uh, blood levels, you know, when I'm testing people's blood levels, they're only changing about, about two, about two or 300 milligrams a day, which is normal, or yeah. two, or three, two or 300 nanograms per deciliter per day, yeah. which is what you ordinarily would change. That's why you do it in the morning. Cause you're about, you're about 300 points later, lower before you go to bed right. than you are in the morning. Um, and so, uh, I, you know, you draw it up with a 20 gauge needle, but then I put a 26, you know, five sixteen twenty six 26 gauge needle, which oh. is only bigger, I was just slightly gonna, bigger than an insulin I was just going to ask you like, how the hell? And you can put it anywhere. Like you can put Cause it, I'm on testosterone put, replacement. Yeah, you can put it in your fat, you put it in your, like anywhere you can pinch some skin. Does that you take do. you 15 minutes to push through a 26 gauge? No, oh, no wow. problem. Takes wow. it, it takes probably. So I've read that that, 20, that 20, also lowers uh, by doing the small doses. This is relatively new. You, yeah. If we brought this up ten years ago, they would, people yeah. would say, "Why? Why would you do that?" Yeah, I, I thought it was stupid years ago because oh, you're putting fat, and that's where all the aromatase is. 
Yeah. Right. Yeah. You're convert no. It. If anything, you it, get it less of it. It didn't turn out that way. Yeah. It, you get, you get better, uh, less sex binding globulin. Sex binding globulin. Hor- yeah, hormone globulin. You get less of a conversion to estrogen. But you, this is what I'm reading so far. So I haven't I haven't seen that. Okay. Um, I control sex hormone binding globulin um, pretty fanatically because that's the primary driver of what's free. Okay. So. Every everything in your bloodstream is being escorted by a protein. Albumin is the most common one, and albumin escorts almost everything. Albumin will bind things irreversibly or reversibly, though. So, uh, 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 it goes by a cell that needs that testosterone molecule. Albumin will let it go. Sex hormone binding globulin doesn't let it go. Once it binds, it's useless. It goes through the liver, gets chopped up, made into completely different compounds. So you want that to be low. The lower that is, the higher your free percentage is. Free is not bound to albumin or sex hormone binding globulin. That's just what's floating around mm-hmm. your bloodstream. Uh, if it's if it's free and bound to albumin, then we call that bioavailable. I don't trust that. It's not because mm-hmm. it's not something that I can say definitively how well like how well are you diffusing from that. So I go off of free. Um, and so if I can drive sex hormone binding globulin down to what a twenty five year old man has, that's fifteen to twenty. Right. And that gives you about a 3% free. So if I can do that, I don't have to get your testosterone super high. So like when I'm doing conservative treatment and mm. I'm giving you clomiphene and I'm giving DHEA and pregnenolone and aromatase inhibitor and like doing like that, I don't have to get you to a thousand. I'd still like to, if I can, but if I get you to 700, but I give you a 3% free, well, now you have a free of 21, which is like the upper quintile of the range. Wow, there, and what, a, what lowers this? So, is it the enclomiphene? Like, what what would you what would you take to lower that? Binding well, long term, if you keep estrogen low, and again, I don't okay. I don't let estrogen go above twenty. Oh, really? Uh, I I keep it somewhere between ten and twenty because that's what the Framingham data showed was normal for okay. twenty year olds or twenty five year olds. Uh, like all the lab n- normal values change over the years. Every ten thousand tests, they re- it's just based they off the average reset their intervals, mm-hmm. right? So, if you go back to Framingham data, normal testosterone was two fifty to eleven hundred. Uh, sex hormone binding globulin in a young man was 15 to 20 estradiol was 10 20 and that like and so that's that's what i go reapproximate so if you keep estradiol the primary driver of sex hormone binding globulin is estradiol so if you keep estrogen low enough sex hormone binding globulin doesn't climb back up it still can by and large it doesn't um I can crush that with a synthetic testosterone so something mm-hmm. like stenazolol or oxandrolone i don't give you enough to have any physiologic effects you're not mm. going to get faster or lean or anything um just to lower that but you do it for about six weeks every, like monday wednesday friday for six weeks and i'll drop uh i mean i've seen people with sex on binding globulins of 200 so they don't have any free like it doesn't matter what their total is because they don't wow. have any free period um and i see this a lot with people who are getting treated out in dock in the box clinics they come see me and they're like hey i've been on testosterone therapy for three years and i'm like yeah, and your estradiol is 200 and your sexual wow. bonding glove is 150 and you're free zero. Wow. Um, and so uh, keeping estradiol low in the long term and then sex hormone and then the the synthetics, you do that for six to eight weeks. I can take an, I can take a sex hormone bonding globulin from say 60 or 80 down to target range of 10 to 20. Wow. Um, what, do you, yeah. what do you what do you think? Because, you know, we talked about sleep and how that affects testosterone. And what do you think is happening? Because over the last, what, six decades or so, we've just seen this nice, consistent drop in testosterone in men to where it's significant. Wow. Like yeah. a, a 20-something-year-old male today is like comparable testosterone to like a 60-something-year-old in, in 1980, whatever. So yeah. like, what, do you think it's just lifestyle, just lack of sleep, just that? Or do you think there's a lot of stuff? I think it's everything. So <laughs> something we were talking about before the podcast started, uh, you know, decreasing weak men in the world. Um you mean increasing weak men, decreasing strong yeah, yeah, men? Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. And, and, yeah. That's what we're trying to do is decrease the yeah, weak men. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and increasing the number of weak men. In that. Um, so I, th- I just find it, uh, and this sounds conspiratorial, I have no evidence to back this up, but I find it really, really strange that every chemical toxin acts like estrogen. They're yeah. all zeoestrogens, mm. right? So BPAs from plastic, mm-hmm. pesticides, uh, weed killing products, like, yeah. like, uh, uh, all like all, like all all these chemical compounds in our environment that are causing us problems, cleaning products, they all act like estrogen in the body. That's definitely a component. The fact that nobody works out hard anymore, like you think about, like if you just work hard all the time, like you don't have to work out. Like I, I t- like plenty of my clients, like they don't, they don't have any athletic ambitions. I'm like, you just. 
just you know be active and do your own stuff right like use the stairs mow your own yeah, lawn go wash build your a own fence. car like you know <laughs> you know, go like go on walks like go you know whatever um and so i think you know life was way harder and we know we know that the only other time you're making testosterone is during hit um if if you do hit you can convert some of your dhea intramuscular oh, to know. testosterone okay. it's a very it's a small amount so intensity basically but also, the more the like the more fit your muscles are, the more demanding are your muscles. The more androgen receptors you're going to have, and the more testosterone right. you're going to take up, which means you're going to have less in the bloodstream to signal the brain to shut it down. So, I mean, that's definitely a component too. Um, and that, and chronic stress and sleep deprivation. Uh, I mean, <clears throat> I you know obviously my you know I have that supplement on the side, so I'm not. Uh, you know, I'm I'm not trying to be self promotional, but I don't think there's anything as important as sleep. I don't think there's anywhere, anything anywhere close to being as important well. There's as nothing sleep. that'll negatively impact your health as no, quickly. Nothing breaks you faster than yes. poor sleep. In and fact, nothing a, will improve your life oh. faster than improving your sleep. Have yeah. you have you you uh, have you utilized? I mean, we talked about how profound uh, the supplement is that you've formulated. What about and, and you just mentioned how sleep? You don't think anything compares to that? Have you used uh, peptides in order to really enhance somebody's sleep? And have you seen any profound effects of that um yeah so anything you do uh, growth hormone wise whether you're actually giving somebody growth hormone or you're just giving me a secretagogue uh gorilla mimetic or uh secretagogue um anytime you're increasing um overall growth hormone and igf1 you're improving a lot of the metabolic pathways you, one of the things you're drastically incre increasing this uh your brain sensitivity to GABA, but it's also affecting some other pathways. Um, it, and it's increasing Delta brainwave sleep and, or Delta mm -hmm. slow wave sleep and things like that. Um, there's a peptide called DSIP. Deep, I've tried uh, that. Yeah. It's either Delta or deep sleep inducing peptide. I've, I've heard, used it. I've seen it. I haven't tried that, yeah. It's about a, it's about a 50, 50 for me. It's like 50% of the, my clients take it and say nothing. I don't get anything out of it. And 50% go, yeah, it works. And maybe, 20% are like fanatical about it. Like, yeah, it really works. Um, but if you use it long term, it actually re regulates uh, your pituitary hormones as well. And it helps to realign circadian rhythms. And so like, I use like the, the, the thymulins, it'll increase melatonin production. It worked for me, but I had to take half the dose. I took a full dose and I would wake up and feel nauseous. It was really strange. Okay. I took half and it did work for me for sure. And then there, there's other uh, peptides uh, like thymulin alpha, uh, TB4, TB500, which are, um, those are sort of regenerative peptides. They help with immune function and they help like repair injuries, re, uh, regenerate cartilage and connective tissue and things like that. Um, but they also work on the pineal gland and, and epithelon more, works more on the pineal gland. But those, anytime you're st uh, stimulating the pineal gland, you're overall increasing melatonin production and increasing and improving circadian rhythm alignment because you can't just get melatonin to secrete at any time. Like it has to, it has to be kind of done along with the circadian uh, rhythm. The two, uh, the peptide, the two peptides they use a combination. The, the most impactful I ever felt was the thymus and beta and uh, BPC one five seven. Combine those two. I noticed uh, I viewed them more in. That's I, the ghrelin mimetic. Okay, yeah, yeah. I beat a was like, I mean, I slept like a baby when I was taking it. Yeah. That. Made it, me hungry, the, though. The growth hormone effect. It has a huge appetite Oh, man, I issue. bulk on yeah. it. It's too much. But yeah. it, uh, I saw that a video of myself in my face. That, that, one also, <laughs> that, that one also can, like, double or triple cortisol, too, though. Oh, really? Um, and it, and and over a long term, so um, MK677, you, you don't want to do that. I never do it more than eight weeks. Some people say 12 weeks, but... It'll drastically reduce insulin sensitivity, hugely increase uh, mm. cortisol levels as well. Um, and it desensitizes really quick. Like all of the early ones desensitize really quick. Um, so like the the hex the hexarelins and anything with this like anything with relin on it and then um, and then uh, anything with a six on it, like the GH GH RH six or GH R P six. Those you know, in like a matter of weeks, <laughs> you're, you're, you're yeah. decreasing. So there, there's actually, um, a neuron in the peptide and the pituitary that's being targeted. And that neuron will actually retreat into the peptide or into the pituitary as, as that gets too high. And you, you can get it to do it irreversibly. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Oh, that's not good. Yeah. So that's why I never use hexarelin because that's known for that. 
Um, mm. and I, I stick with uh, CJC if I'm rolling, if I'm going to do a secret or good old, yeah. or CJC, what about Tessa CJC Merlin? deck. Tessa Merlin is awesome, but it's really hard to get. Yeah. And, uh, and it's usually really expensive because you need two milligrams a day of that. Um, I used to use that all the time. Uh, TaylorMade had that five or six years ago, very reasonably priced. And mm -hmm. like that, that's by far, um, you can't, and then the MK677, you can also go super physiologic on it because it's, it's, uh, not affected by the, um, feedback loop. Whereas Tessa Merlin, I could max Only people out, so but I never got anybody super yeah. physiologic, no matter how much they took. Yeah. So that's a, that's really a great one. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. yeah some MK677s that I beat them more that you were talking about. Oh, yeah. uh, okay. Yeah. But that one okay. for me was like, cause when I communicated that on the podcast, cause people like, they like the growth hormones of Gritagogs to help them get leaner. I'm like, uh, I don't know if you, I beat them in or MK6. That's a, that's a tough one to get lean on for me because my appetite is. Yeah, you eat like a pig on that stuff. <laughs> I'm hungry, man. And you'll gain like 30 pounds in eight weeks. But yeah. And then you'll lose 10, or you'll lose 20 of it like yeah. three it was, days after yeah, you stop. It was, the most, it was the most insane bulking, you know, yeah. appetite that I'd, I'd ever <laughs> tried. So, yeah. wow. So when you're, when you're looking at somebody's, uh, and you're working with somebody looking at their sleep, um, what about sleep uh, like habits? Like, for example, I I found for myself, like I learned this a while ago. It was a huge one. It's just going to bed at the same time, waking up at the same time every day because I had heard it communicated <laughs> that uh, we essentially just sleep, you know, jet lag ourselves every Monday because mm -hmm. we go to bed late Friday night, sleep in Saturday, late mm -hmm. Saturday night, sleep in Sunday. And then it's like you're you're pushing your skating rhythm off two, three hours every single week and have to readjust. Right. So that was a big one. Do you have like, the, are, there, are there big big ones for you that you're like, okay, let's try yeah. this first. And so, uh, you know, d despite you know, doing all the things I've talked about, you know, uh, you know, nutrition, exercise, stress mitigation, mindfulness training, peptides, SARMs, SERMs, hormones, hyperbaric, psychedelics, like all the, the most powerful thing I do is like this three page worksheet that I've come up with. Really? <laughs> I, I can give it to you. I can give it to you guys to Sweet. pump out to your, your audience or whatever. Um, and it, and it's the foundation of it is what you're talking about, right? So we're trying to reset circadian rhythms, but the number one reason, like I said earlier, psychophysiologic insomnia, people can't sleep because they're worried they can't sleep. So when people lay in bed and they can't sleep, they start stressing and then they'll look at the clock and then they'll try to figure out how many more, they start doing math. Like, oh, if I don't, you know, like if I yeah. go back to sleep in the next I've guilty, that guilty. And now has. they're, now they're waking up and they're like, well, I'll skip the shower or I'll skip the gym. Like, right. And they, and right. And now you're getting a terrible night's sleep. <clears throat> so, um, the circadian alignment, if somebody has sleep problems, well, in general with everything I do, all the lifestyle things I do, I go for a Pareto distribution, man, because mm. that's everywhere in the world. And it's true with you too. So I tell all my clients, I'm like 80% of the time, dude, 80% yeah. of the time, do everything right. 20% of the time you're going to fall off. Don't beat yourself up about it. It's the way it goes. And the whole point of being really healthy and resilient is so that I can do that 20%. That's it right. doesn't kill yeah. me. Right. Yeah. So like I can go out and do something stupid with my buddies if I want to and like sleep deprive myself a little bit or stay mm -hmm. up later or like whatever, overtrain for a bit. Um, so <clears throat> I, I tell people, you know, you set two alarm clocks. You set an alarm clock to tell you when it's time to get ready to go to bed. Hmm. That alarm clock is just as important as the morning alarm clock. I mean, it's identical. You have to get up and go to work. You have to go to sleep. The psychology component, sort of the CBT component of this is the most important part, though. And that takes four to six weeks to kind of click in. But the gist of it is the most capable you were, you ever are in any 24-hour period is about 90 minutes to four hours after you wake up. So if you have important stuff to handle in your life, things that are stressing you out, for instance, that's the time to handle yeah. that. That's peak you. That's the best you are. If you if that's the best, like if you're going to fight Mike Tyson, do you want to be at your best or do you want to be uh, yeah. uh, mediocre? It's like, well, I'm going to get killed if, anyway, but I'm, maybe I'll survive <laughs> if I can be my best, right? And so the alarm clock says it's time to get ready for bed. Nobody gets ready for bed anymore. Evolutionarily, the sun went down. We didn't go to sleep for three hours, right? Because it takes time for all the physiologic changes in our brain. Sleep hygiene is three things. Decrease blue light, decrease activity, your interaction with the world, right? What you're thinking about, how much you're acting, how much you're moving, lower body temperature. Sun went down, blue light went away, GABA gets secreted, your brain slows down. Mm -hmm world gets colder, you get colder. That's what we evolved to. That's what makes us feel sleepy. Adenosine is sleep pressure. It's slightly different. But so nobody's going to spend three hours getting ready for bed, but maybe an hour. So yeah. you're going to go to bed at 10, nine o'clock, no more blue light. 
no Texas Chainsaw Massacre, no working on work products, no work, you know, work projects, no working out, you know, no karate in the job in the garage, any of that stuff. Like you do what about sex. <laughs> It depends on how you do it. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm like, come on, man. You're right, killing me so here. So you, you have an hour to get ready for you to bed. Once that hour happens, you get into bed. Back up. You start with a list. Uh, you do this during the day when you're not going to be stressed. So maybe 5 p.m. Your brain's working fine. You take a line right down the middle of a piece of notebook paper. On one side is the to-do list. The other side is the to-worry list. The difference being to do, you actually know what to do. There's some action to be taken to worry. You don't know what you're going to do about it, but you know you're going to worry about it and you don't want to forget to worry about shit. So you're just going to like, you have no control over it, but put it on the list and you'll understand why in a second. So, and then the to do, it goes out as far as you will stress. If you're somebody who will stress over something six months away, that needs to be on your to do list. Oh, I see. If you're somebody like me, who doesn't think more than a day ahead, yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. it's like, what do I gotta do tomorrow? Like, that's, <laughs> it's all on my list, yeah. right? And then that's handwritten. You put it next to your bed with a pencil. So if you forget anything, you can get up and put that on your list. So you go to bed, 10 o'clock, nine o'clock alarm clock goes off. You decrease blue light, decrease activity. You turn the temperature down. You take a cool shower or something like that. You lower your body temperature. Those three things, you get in bed at nine o'clock. Your goal is to be in bed until that morning alarm clock goes off. And I don't care if you need an alarm clock or not, but you're, because that's something you can worry about. Well, what if... What if I oversleep? If I don't have yeah. one, so you're going to have an alarm clock. That's going to be eight hours after you get in bed. From the time you get in the bed until the time that alarm clock goes off, you have one job to relax as much as possible. So you're going to lay down. You're going to do meditation, prayer, breath work, progressive muscle relaxation, guided meditation, whatever the hell relaxes you. I don't care. And if you do that for eight hours, get up the next day and go to work. Hmm. Okay. <clears throat> <clears throat> that won't happen. You start <laughs> you start doing that, you're going to fall asleep. If you wake up, there's no there's no cues to tell you what time it is, right? You're in a blacked out room, there's no no there's no reason for you to know what time it is. You're not going to look at a clock. If you got to go to the bathroom, get up, go to the bathroom, get back in bed. You don't know if your alarm clock's going off 4 hours from now or 15 minutes from now. Don't check it. Don't look. You lay down in bed and you go, "I'm going to lay here and do breath box breathing." until my alarm clock goes off or I fall back asleep. If your alarm clock's not going to go for four hours, you're going to fall back asleep. If it goes off 15 minutes later, you got seven hours and 45 minutes of sleep and 15 minutes of box breathing. Now you're at your best. Get up and go. Once you realize that the best you can possibly be for tomorrow is if that's all you've done, if anything pops up in your head that's on that list, you go, that's on my list. I do that in the morning. I'm not, why am I going to handle that now? Why am I going to worry about something I can't physically take any action on? It's on my list. I'm going to do it in the morning. Like once you can get yourself to believe that, then you can truly relax. And as soon as people can truly relax and just lay there, they don't have any idea how much they slept, yeah. right? Because all they did was meditate and sleep. Yeah. And maybe they slept eight hours. Maybe they slept four hours. Maybe they slept six hours. They don't know. They know they meditated for a while and they know they slept for a while. And then over time, you'll just sleep the whole night. Yeah, I, you know, I, uh, something I just started uh, doing, which um, I mean, now uh, uh, talking about it, it's like obvious, but a lot of us, uh, when we're in bed, we'll go on our phones, right? Terrible idea, right? Yeah. But this is, and in, in, in we'll, we'll read articles, social media, whatever. Mm -hmm. For a long time, people read paper books mm -hmm. in bed, and so for myself, you know, if I have issues with sleep, what can happen with me is I'll start thinking about something. And then my mind will start to spin around that, and then and then it becomes very, very difficult. Right. But if I read a fiction mm -hmm. book, not nonfiction, nonfiction will get me spinning. I start reading about something, biography or something interesting, right. I can stay up. But if I read fiction on paper with a little dim light or whatever, I, I it puts me off into dreamland very quickly. So yeah. that's a new thing that I started. So that, that's the that's the same technique, right? Uh, so. We're just, we're just replacing the book with box breathing, progressive yeah. muscle relaxation, right. meditation, prayer, like whatever it is that you do to relax yourself. Just find like three or four ways to reduce your stress, figure out what works for you, and you do that. And we're just replacing that because <laughs> the book can get interesting, right? Oh, right. And that can push you off another sure. 30 minutes. Yeah, you're 50, right. right? Um, and then you are getting some light in your eyes. You could wear blue blocking glasses, but, you know, it, it just makes more sense to just say, yeah, you're right. hey, I have 16 hours to do everything I can get done in a day. 
I have eight hours to repair and prepare for tomorrow. And if I want to be prepared tomorrow, because obviously my goal tomorrow is to be the best I can. There's no way I can be my best if I don't get eight hours of sleep. Right. What do you do about when you travel? I, could, we just went through a, a like a month and a half. <laughs> yeah, of, five time zones in 30 days. I mean, it was yeah. crazy. <laughs> and, uh, um, and you know, that really will throw you off. Is, is there, are there any ways you could uh, help, I guess, accelerate the acclimation to a new time zone or maybe mitigate some yeah, yeah. negatives? So uh, it that can get super complex and convoluted and people forget when I try to get too technical with it. The easiest thing I can say is that if you stimulate your brain and body early in the morning, you will go to sleep earlier that night. You're bringing your circadian rhythm towards you. Okay. If you want to go to bed later, you put that stuff later in the day. All right. So if you if you put bright lights in your eyes at 7 p.m., you do th you do like 30 minutes of bright light therapy, and you don't need a you know, high lux box, or whatever, but you know, some, you don't stare in the light, but it's like 30 degrees above this. You get a bunch of light, you get a bunch of sun sign. I, I don't recommend tanning beds, but you know, the idea. So you get a lot of light that will make it harder to go to sleep. Like, because that's revving up your cortisol levels again, okay. you're stimulating your, your brain up. Um, and then exercise, like ex ex exercise raises your heart rate, raises your metabolic rate, like all the stuff. And it makes it harder to go to sleep. So if you, you know, you fly somewhere, it's like, Hey man, bedtime, you know, the, I want to go to bed right now. I need to stay up for four more hours. It's like, get, you know, get your workout in, get your bright light at the end of the day. If the opposite's true and it's like, Hey, I, you know, here I'm, here I am waking up at four o'clock in the morning and I'm like, I'm not going to be sleepy when 10 o'clock comes around tonight, get your bright light therapy, get your exercise in the morning. And then of course, you know, of course you can use stimulants to kind of push things out, mm -hmm. but I don't recommend I mean, the half-life of caffeine is, ridiculously variable it's anywhere from like four hours to 30 hours so you need to know where you lay on that then continuum. it's like genetic right like how your liver yeah. breaks it down yeah it's a huge hugely genetic thing so if you know how well you process uh, alcohol you know i'd give yourself like two half lives before you go to bed you mm. know like before your bedtime um and then uh you know if you aren't getting good sleep when you're uh, when you're traveling, I, you know, I highly recommend naps. I mean, there's a lot of controversy around that. There's a great book by Sarah Mednick out of UCSD called Take a Nap, and it has this little wheel on it, and you can put in what time you woke up and, uh, you know, what you're trying to optimize. You're trying to optimize creativity, cognitive functioning, or overall oh, health. Cool. It shall tell you what time of day to take a nap and for how long. Um, you know, if you take a really short nap, it, in it increases creativity. If you take a medium nap, creativity and cognitive functioning, executive functioning. And then if you do like a sleep cycle, you know, like 90 minutes or something, then you get like a sleep cycle. So you get like everything you would get in your first sleep cycle at night. You get all the um, metabolic hormonal repair, mm -hmm. immune improvement and all that stuff. Well, very so we've asked a lot of questions that I think will add tremendous value to the, our audience. And so that I have some selfish stuff that I want to ask you. All right. Uh, hit me. Like seal stuff. Okay. Uh, baddest seal you've ever, you've ever met. Why? Um, well, I mean, there, there's a caveat to that because uh, like I didn't operate with a lot of these, with a lot of guys I know. Right. So as far, as far as the guys that like I've trained with and I know really well, um, uh, my buddy that I talked about taking down to Mexico for the Ibogaine, hardest man I've ever known in my life. Like can't, can't even imagine him dying. You know, like I made a joke one time about him getting killed by a grizzly bear and, he laughed. He goes, Grizzly Bear can't kill me. <laughs> <laughs> and he was serious. I mean, I like we all know of Grizzly Bear, but he he's a super hard man. Uh I mean I, I mean you hear Marcus Marcus Latrell's story and I mean he one of my all time just, favorite books. Just just surviving that. Like you've got to be one of the hardest men on the planet to mm. live through what he's lived through and and for it not to cognitively destroy you too. Right, right. right. To live to live with all of that too. So what's the spectrum look like? I mean, obviously anyone who makes it has got to be kind of a hard I mean, you're you're already a badass just to even make that elite group. Is there a spectrum within that spectrum? Like is there I mean, you got these these ten or twelve guys in this group and there's For sure. Okay. I mean, there there's you know, it it's a community and it takes all kinds of guys. Like you know, when I went through 
SEAL training. Like SEALs, SEALs are bigger now. Like once they started getting some kind of celebrity status, then it got super competitive to get into SEAL training. Mm -hmm. Like I couldn't even get into SEAL training now. Like uh, Really? It's I, changed that uh, much? Like you have people with PhDs going in and listed just because it's so hard to get in, you know? Uh, I mean, it, it's a super competitive. And I don't know about now, but, you know, um, yeah, d during the war, it definitely was was that crazy. Um, but, you know, when I went through when I went through SEAL training, everybody was a little enduro machine, man, because that's all he did. We just ran, swim, calisthenics, calisthenics, run, swim. Like, I mean, you're running like 10 miles a day, swimming miles a day, doing calisthenics for hours a day. Um, and everybody there was like five foot eight and that's that's like, that was one of the dude, 50 pounds. That and, was one of the first things that surprised yeah. me was the size of your yeah. outer seal. And then I like, and you, know, you go on these conditioning runs and they're the, the uh, instructors out there running, you know, six minute miles, five and a half minute miles for six, seven miles. Like my big ass can't keep up with that. I'm like, <laughs> you kidding me, dude? Just like, uh, you know, actually, I mean, I, towards the end of buds, I could keep up, but I lost a ton of weight in buds. Like I lost 40 pounds in six months. Whoa. Yeah. Oh, wow. and I wasn't fat at all. I mean, I was, I was very lean when I started, but I just lost all my muscle. Yeah. 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 Um, what, are, what are the characteristics uh, that make like the, the baddest, baddest seal? I mean, what is it? You have to have a little bit of crazy to you. Or are you just hard as nails, <laughs> resilient? I mean, all those things. Player, I, yeah. I, I think a, a clear set of principles, uh, you know, that, that's always a good guidance tool for anything in the world, you know, because there's there's always going to be confusing situations. And so when you have a really clear why and a clear set of principles, why you why you do the things you do and why you're there, uh, that helps a lot. You obviously have to be, I don't know if athletic is the right term, but, you know, very physically adaptable and strong and resilient. Um, but, you know, to, to make it through training, like most, most of my friends and I, the – the consensus amongst all of us has always been that the guys who make it are the guys who are who are literally legitimately uh, willing to die to make it through training. Mm. Um, yeah, because uh, which so is I, which is pathological at eighteen. Yeah. You know, to think that you're going to die to get through some that, training. Right? But yeah. I remember half a dozen times in buds thinking, "All right, I'm about to die. Like, I I can't yeah. keep doing this. I, this is going to kill me." But I, I ain't quitting. So I, here we go. I talked to somebody who was still, <laughs> yeah. he told me that, I mean, uh, you know, people that you get in, you get into the testing. I mean, you got the physical fitness to pass, right? It's the mental part that right. fucks it. And it's, a, it's what you just explained right there. Right. Like, are you willing to just keep doing this? Yeah. And, and, uh, yeah, the, the seal teams forever have been trying to predict success because 85% of the people fail, which means 85 cents of every dollar that goes into training is wasted. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it's a huge financial gain if they can predict success. And one of my uh, good friends is a, a sports psychologist, and they hired him. Uh, he spent like two years trying to figure out a, a, a success pathway, like some markers, like what can we do to. And he finally came to con he, conclusion. He said, "I can't, I can't, I can't predict success, but I can predict failure." Yeah. And he said. Uh, the amount of adversity that you've had in your life is the best predictor of whether or not you'll make it. And if the worst thing that's ever happened to you is your parents got divorced, you you shouldn't be that, coming here. I was going to ask wow. you. I was going to ask yeah. you that. I had a similar yeah. childhood as you did, and, I'm, yeah. and I think that's what, part of what is uh, always made me very interested in, yeah. in seals and stuff like that. I would is most the guy at 18 years old. If you have that switch of I'm willing to go till I die, right. I would imagine most all of them that make it come from kind of a rough background. I yeah. get you doubt you get the we were, we were the dirty dozen back then. I mean, like you know the Vietnam era seals were sketchy dudes, and the, yeah. those were our instructors. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like those, uh, yeah. you know, and uh, and like you know we're you know, there's you know you hear those stories about uh, somebody going in front of the judge and saying you're either going to the military, or you're going to prison. I knew four of those guys <laughs> and like in, in one platoon. I had four of those guys in my platoon. So like, like it, it's legitimate. Uh, I mean, it, but like I said, it, it's usually people like I know, I mean, not, not that I want to give any gratitude to my stepfather, but like the amount of mental torture I took, uh, you know, mental, emotional, you know, physical too, but like the mental, emotional torture of my life was much harder than buzz. Like, you know, the stuff they were doing, I could kind of go, this is kind of juvenile. Like mm. you can't, you guys need to up this up. Like I, I like 18 years old and I know exactly what you're doing. Do you, and this isn't tricking me at all. Do you remember when that's, so I, it, it took me till I was about my, my mid to late twenties 
before I, I shifted my mindset from the victim mentality of feeling sorry for the way I grew up to realizing like, oh shit, this is my superpower mm. was I went through a lot more than the average kid had to go through. And so it made yeah. me, do you remember at what point in your life that you've, you've kind of, because I'm sure as a young <laughs> 17, 18 year old, you probably hated your stepdad and, and maybe even had some resentment towards your mom because she married him similar to like me. Yeah. At what point did that switch? Well, so I think for me, um, I, my mom didn't get remarried till I was eight. And so I had been the man of the house for my mom, her sister, my sister, and my grandmother. Mm. I, was, I was the only male there. They sent me out in the living room with my Red Rider BB gun when they thought they heard something at two in the morning. Like that, you know, so I thought like I was the man of the family. And then, you know, she got remarried and this dude was abusive like the first day. I mean, like it was immediate. Oh, and I really thought I could step in and protect, right? And then, of course, I couldn't. I was eight and, he, you know, uh, and so um that screwed with my mindset for for a while um but he knew he knew my real father and my real father was bigger stronger smarter <laughs> better looking like whatever like he was a, and and so he really hated me because i was uh, like the potential of that and his biggest fear was that i was going to grow up to be a better man than he was or something um and because I knew that about my father, I just thought, well, I'm going to be like my father and then I'm going to kick his ass. Right. It was like, <laughs> and so like I, I started lifting weights like immediately, like the first Christmas we were married, I, or they were married. I told my mom, I, I want a weight set. Wow, I didn't early. know how to do anything, but I just like did overhead press at the, that hollow bar with those oh, yeah. red concrete yeah. filled things. And, yeah, we all worked out those, and yeah. I yep. just, I just lifted weights all day. And then I, you know, I did martial arts and I boxed and I played football and I ran track and field. And just like, I was just going to be so big and strong that, you know, and, and that was kind of my mindset the whole time. So uh, I had two brothers and two sisters though, that all ended up, shattered lives alcoholic drug addicts and all that other mm. stuff like none, none of them adopted that mindset that yeah. i had you know At what it, what age was it when when you hit that point when you could defend yourself and when it, it, he probably no longer fucked with you at 16 years old i had him on his knees crying with a gun in his mouth wow, oh, wow. whoa no shit no shit wow wow and fortunately the cops showed up and I didn't end up in prison for the rest of my life, but wow. that was the end of any animosity between he and I. And then, so, and okay, did you still? Like, I was out by seventeen, so I, I, I left. They got home. divorced when I was sixteen. Oh, so and then he broke into our house. Oh, so it was after tore the house all to pieces. I came home, blood everywhere, furniture broken. He comes and cuts us off on the road and says, "I just killed your mom," and went back to his house. <clears throat> and took the keys of our car. We were, we were in my mom's car, my sister's driving. And so I ran to my house down the middle of the street, like December and a pair of running shorts, uh, barefoot, ran to my house about a mile, got a gun, ran to his house, was about two miles away, kicked in his front door, jumped on him, beat the shit out of him a little and put the gun in his mouth and then the cops kicked oh, in the door. Holy cow. Whoa. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. That, that'll, that'll grow you up real quick. Yeah. Real quick. Wow. Man, so crazy. Did, when, later on when you were, you know, doing, have you done the psychedelic therapy and all that stuff? I've done all, uh, pretty much all of it. Yeah. When yeah. you do that, did that help? In, cause, cause obviously it turned you into who right. you were, but then there's also side effects of that, right? Did you ever yeah. try to I integrate all that or? Yeah. I mean, I, um, I definitely repress a lot of stuff. Like of I course. don't, I don't have any, I have very, very few memories from my yeah, childhood. It's like okay. almost none. Um, and most of what I know, it's because my brothers and sisters have talked about it 50 times and now I remember it, but had, if they didn't talk about it, I would, I would have no, I'd think I would have none, uh, other than maybe the story I just told you, that's probably, yeah. uh, the one I would remember. Um, and, uh, <laughs> the first, the first psychedelic I did was ayahuasca. Oh, you went big, right? And it was the three, yeah. it was three nights, three nights in a row. And I kept trying to reflect on my childhood and I couldn't. It was too, it was too, too, your brain was protecting you. I don't know because I was so gone. Like I'm so sensitive. It's like, you like just a joke. Uh, I, this is years and years ago. I had a, a girlfriend at the time and she was 110 pounds. She took twice as much as I did. Uh, like I, I took it. They said, Hey, we're going to give you this 45 minutes later. We'll uh, to an hour later, we'll ask you if anybody wants more. And then, you know, you go up to the mantle there and you drink it and then you crawl back to your mat and you lay down. By the time I laid down, I was 
off the planet. Like wow. I was just like, God. and I, I just remember I'm just laying there going too much, too much. <laughs> I was like, this is too, oh, too much. And like, I was paralyzed and I had just all these images going through my head. It's like, it felt like 300 different images per second. Just like everything was flipping so fast. And I was just overwhelmed going, Whoa. And, uh, and like, I'm like, I don't know how I'm going to get anything out of this because I can't think like, I can't yeah. even concentrate on any of this. It's going so fast. And then I'm, and then after a long time of laying there, I'm like, I'm like, geez, maybe, maybe this is almost over. Like maybe I'm going to start coming. And then I hear him go, anybody want seconds? <laughs> I was like, oh man, <laughs> my heart just sank. Uh, and then my girlfriend's like, I do. <laughs> I'm like, oh, it's so emasculating. And then uh, she goes up there and gets it and still like, um, and then the next night I tried to do it. The next night I tried to do it. I did five MEO DMT, which is just like a super universal oneness kind of meeting God mm -hmm. thing, ego death kind of, but that's super fast. Uh, almost never is there negative things in that. Um, I did psilocybin. I did psilocybin retreat and I fought, I fought Satan for what, like, that's all I could figure it was. Like I fought Satan for like six hours. Um, and I still couldn't think of my stepdad. Uh, I did tried Ibogaine. Have you tried ketamine yeah, therapy? I've never, I've never tried ketamine. I just did that. I just yeah. did eight, yeah, eight weeks of, uh, of ketamine therapy. That mm -hmm. was uh, really interesting. Yeah. So that one. I've done the ketamine nasal spray. I've never done the ketamine injections or IV. So uh, you, know, you, you know the research better than I do, but from what I've read um, on this, because I got really into it, um, for certain types of PTSD, you know, those cluster of symptoms or whatever, it seems to be really good because it's such a strong disassociative. So yeah. literally, uh, because uh, the theory is the reason why people don't remember these memories or why they're repressed is you, you can't, your brain doesn't, it's safe. It's not safe. Sorry, right. not going to let you remember this. Right. And so the disassociative makes, literally, because you can disassociate, you feel safe enough to have. Yeah. And uh, that was the experience I had. My wife did the same thing, huge one. So. Yeah. I mean, it, yeah, the, the sort of the, you know, the quintessential pathway of that, of all those psychedelics is that, you know, it represses the ego enough for you to see things you need to work on. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's like, um, there's no solutions there. It's just like, it opens up a bunch of doors for you. It's like, oh, see that, see yeah. that, see that. Um, a lot of people do Ibogaine and say, you know, <clears throat> that they watch themselves watch themselves, you know, and that's one of the ways you get the ego out of it. Because if it's not you doing it, there's a term for that. It's like super something, right? Yeah. Yeah. I can't yeah. Remember it. Um, and so, uh, you know, there's a lot of metaphors around like watching a movie of your life or watching television in your life, whatever. And the idea of that, but you know, and I, and it's probably had a lot to do with the amygdala tone going away, being less stress. Um, opening up your prefrontal cortex and all that, because you know, we, we protect ourselves all the time. You know, like we're, we're protecting ourselves with our posture right yeah. now. Like everything's like there uh, and, and then 90% of it's subconscious, but you get rid of that. Um, and then you can go back and reconsider things. And that's where neuroplasticity comes from. That's right? Right, yeah. Neuroplasticity is that I don't think about the same thing the same way all the time. Right. right? So I get to see it and go, well, that's kind of a dumb idea. Like I always do that. Like here's 20 examples in my life of me doing that thing. Mm -hmm. Now I didn't solve it. I still have to figure out how I don't do it in mm -hmm. the future. And the longer that- but You got to be able to see it first. Yeah, but you have to see it first. And so you get the answers and then you start going through, hey, well, I got to do, I got to do the work. I got to keep on this. I got to figure out how I'm going to not do that anymore. And then the longer, the, the higher the durability of whatever you're using- the more chances you have to do that, right? So if you have like Ibogaine, it's going to last nine months and you're going to have this decreased amygdala yeah. tone and like a high, like a hyper neuroplastic brain where you can make these changes. As long as you're doing the work to make the changes, you come out of that. Uh, if you don't do anything, you just go right back to yeah. where you were. Well, some people get just, yeah. they just use it just to almost like it's a high. Right. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's kind of popular. Yeah. The therapy that I did was with a therapist. So it was all legit. Compound that, I mean, that's, the, whole that's deal. the only way to do it yeah. now. And, and we didn't start doing it that way in the, in the special warfare community, but we're doing it that way now. Yeah. And I think that's smart because uh, it's like a double edged sword too, because if you're not, especially if you don't have someone there helping to integrate with you and your brain does think, Oh, you're safe. Here you go. And it's not, it doesn't yeah. feel it, it. Maybe it wasn't safe. Um, it can actually make things worse. And those people right. come out with like really terrible experiences. Right. So. Do you have kids? I do have three. You have three? What are the yeah. ages? 25, 23, and 19. Oh, okay, so yeah, you had just one. Grown kids. Okay, what was it, yeah, what was it like then, especially with all the, the trauma you had growing up and the, probably the hard ass that you were, 
raising a kid that far back, your 25 year old. Mm -hmm. How, what was that? I mean, do you imagine obviously well, you're much wiser today than you were 25 years ago? The way, the way I used, uh, the way I used my childhood experience and my stepfather was, um, I, I, and I'm not doing this to sound like a victim or be hyperbolic, but I, I genuinely, he's genuinely the worst person I know. Like yeah. in every, like every metric of how I would measure somebody, he's the worst person I know. So anytime I came to a crossroads, I'd go, what would he do? And do the opposite. <laughs> Just do the opposite. I feel, don't you and feel so like, it's like I've never raised a hand on my kids. I've hardly even yelled at my kids, you know, like I, like I punish them, those rules, but it's like a soft punishment. It's like, you know, taking away your phone or like right. or, you know, whatever, something like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it, you know, it, at the end of the day, it, it probably made me a much more compassionate father because I just realized what not to do. I feel how, like you, like you're, how you, dysfunctional it you're was. One or the other in yeah. that situation. Yeah, you have. Right. You, you either cycle, you either yeah. repeat the cycle, or, or you, you become that extreme, man, yeah. or you go the opposite, yep. where you're just like exactly. You look at the way they did things, and you're like, I'm going the, the opposite. The only way. people I've ever met in my life who are like, I never touch alcohol, never touch whatever drugs, whatever. It's because they their parents yeah. were alcoholics. Yes, and, and they're just show. like, no, but don't have no it. interest whatsoever. You know. Well, I. I grew up similarly. So, you know, I'm, I'm from like pure white trash family, uh, you know, 10th generation Texans, lots of trailer parks involved and all that. Um, uh, like the Jerry Springer show people, yeah. when that was popular, <laughs> I was like, why do people watch this? And it's like, <laughs> <laughs> this is my neighbors go outside. Like, yeah. like my, my family does is like all this stuff. I know I, like every kind of criminal you can imagine. I had my, I had my family, like I had 27 con cousins. I think 25 of the 27 are in prison or wow. in prison. It was like, um, and they were all they were all into drugs, you know, and they were all into criminal activity. And I was just like, I'm not going to be that person, man. And so, like, when I was playing Texas 5A football, and a few guys were like, "Hey, we can get a little steroids and get a little faster and stronger," I'm like, "Dude, that's just like heroin to me. Like, you're putting a needle in yourself and you're taking a drug. Like, hell mm -hmm. no, I'm not doing any of that." And I drank beer, but I I wouldn't let myself get drunk, you know. Like, I probably got drunk maybe two or three times in wow. in high school. I just never wanted to relinquish that control and maybe get to where I was going to do something really stupid. Um, yeah. So I kind of had that same response, even though it wasn't like my parents, uh, but just growing up in an environment like that, where you see the holes that everybody are digging for themselves every day. Yeah, yeah. And you're just like, ah, uh, I can't, I can't go down that. I path, mean, man. now that you have kids that are, that are that grown and you look back now, um, what do you think are some of the, the best things that you did raising them as a father? And then maybe what are some things uh, you might've done differently or maybe mistakes that you did? Well, if I'm honest, I raised my boys and my daughter completely different. So I have two sons and a daughter. Um, my, my boys, I was, I was, I was probably a little, uh, uh, insufficient in my empathy and compassion for them. You're just was, harder on I them. I was a little harder on them just because, you know, I'm traditional. I think men have a role and part of that role is being stoic and being a protector and like doing shit that you're scared of and doing shit you don't want to do and making it look like you're not scared. Like that's kind of part of it for me and mm -hmm. I not, 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 mm -hmm. not necessarily right. Um, so that that would be my my regret, but I think uh, I, I think the benefit for them, you know, is that, um, you know, I I I showed them I showed them a way to be like you know masculine and strong and definitive and a provider and a protector and not be a prick, you know, not be like they've now maybe they've seen me angry once. I mean, they've seen me pissed off at the airport, but you know, not, <laughs> everybody's you know, pissed off at the everybody's airport. Pissed off at the airport yeah, but, uh, That's why I get there four hours early. <laughs> it's yeah. a big yeah. joke Trouble going around here. And, and, then, and then my daughter is a little bit the other way. I probably just let her manipulate me, you know, because I mean, you know, those daughters, big eyes, a little bit of tears. And I mean, you're just like, I can't, oh, you're done. I, can't, I can't do that. I got two and two. <laughs> you know, what's funny is that you're talking to a lot of parents. Uh, it's, it, and I see this with my wife too. It seems like dads are a little harder on their sons and moms a little harder on the daughters. Like yeah, my, sure. my daughters and manipulate the shit out of me. Yeah. But with their mom, it's not, yeah. not like that. And I think it's because we get, like I, I get what's going on, with my boy. Right. You know what I mean. So it's well, like we now, know what it's like to be a boy. Yeah, we, we know, know what they're the trying game, to pull, and like yeah, and the same thing with moms and, and daughters. And we don't I think, think that about like we don't think women do the things they yeah. do, oh, like, yeah. especially yeah. Like, yeah. Daughter, like you, right? you get really close to a woman, she starts telling you how women and you're like what? Women, yeah. women do that? What? Are you kidding me? <laughs> I would have never thought that. Yeah. I would have yeah. never thought. planned. Yeah, I remember my daughter. 
uh, she, we, she, we, I had my kids like 50, 50. We got, I got divorced with their mom. And so they had two weeks at my house, two weeks at their house. And there was an overlap for Halloween. They were doing two different Halloweens. And so they did Halloween at my neighborhood first and they got, I mean, buckets of candy, like mm-hmm. just huge. And I'm like, Hey, y'all just leave that candy here. And you're going to your mom's tomorrow night to do that there. And when you come back here, you'll have your candy here. <clears throat> and, uh, and then I went in my daughter's bedroom to tuck her in later on, and their, her candy wasn't up on the counter. And I was like, where's your candy, baby? And she's like, I don't know. I'm like, it's a little sketchy. And I'm like, what do you mean you don't know? She's like, I don't, I, I, I don't know. I left it up there. And I kind of moved some things, and I'm like, is it in your backpack? And she's like, no. And I'm like, I'm going to open this backpack. Are you gonna? You sure it's not in there? And she's crying, no, it's not in there. And I opened, of course, it's in there. And uh, I did this thing where, like, I I didn't pay my kids real money, but I paid them. Uh, I went to like the dollar store and get those like fake bills, and uh, and I paid them for their chores and for their work, and they get money for grades and for good manners and whatever. And and I would take money away. We had this chart on the wall, like all these things they wanted, and it took like you know five thousand dollars to be able to do this, and you know whatever. And so my daughter was saving to go to Paris. And I'm like, oh, I, I forgot, taking a hundred dollars away or something like that. But, and it was like, she, she literally had to save like $10,000 because it, like it's big bills. I'm giving them like, and, uh, I take that away and she's just screaming and crying. He's like, I'm never going to get to Paris. <laughs> <laughs> and she's just bawling her eyes out. And I'm like, I'm sitting there just like playing tough. I'm like, honey, you knew the rules. Like, you know, every, everybody tries to do these things. It's not right. And you lied to me. And I like, you know, I'm just super calm. And I went in my room. I nearly threw up. Like I nearly <laughs> threw up. And you I sat in my room and cried for like five minutes going, oh, wow. If oh, kids like only my knew nervous that. system was shaking like crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And she's always had that power over me. My boy's wreck their bikes you're bleeding everywhere i'm like walk it off you'll be Rub fine some testing on it. <laughs> which one which one so where's your daughter fall she's the youngest she's or? the youngest oh, yeah. okay so she's 19 it. yeah so what she's happened a, she's at uc irvine okay so so is, is she scared to bring a boy home is she like hey because because you know <laughs> i mean <laughs> you know uh <laughs> She, she's yet to have a boyfriend. I mean, like she's maybe date, she's scared she's to bring a home. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Like, <laughs> uh, I mean, I I mean, I live in Austin. She's at UC Irvine, so like she could have it, whatever going on. But like every time I see her, or see her on social media, whatever. It was like, yeah. Randomly, there's a guy in the picture. But she, yeah, she's just kind of like a goody two shoes girl, which that's is great, great, great for me. Good for you. Yeah, that's so great. I'm happy for that. That's awesome. awesome. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's awesome. I, I'm glad she's not one of those Instagram girls showing her butt. Oh, for, oh god, god. My that has to be like the biggest fear of every father. Oh my right god, now, right? Is to become like your, that yeah, I mean, new stripper pole. Like, yeah, when I was a kid, it's like your job as a dad is keep keep your daughter off the pole, right? right. Like yeah. if, if she's on the pole, you failed. Like, yeah. There's no yeah. way around that, yeah. you know. And now it's like if she's in instagram model <laughs> yeah oh man have you seen that meme where there's a guy and a girl at the bar and he's like what do you do she said I'm oh an instagram model and he said <laughs> what do you do yeah i'm a yeah what do you do i'm a soldier for call of duty, call of duty. <laughs> <laughs> i haven't seen that, <laughs> seen that. <laughs> i'm a soldier for call of duty Perfect. Uh, yeah, well good deal man this has been great it's been yeah, great, yeah, man. Yeah, a great yeah, conversation glad we finally so, leaked up we got two yeah, week, uh, yeah, mutual yeah. friends so yeah. we'll, we'll make sure that you know people check out your book um it's uh, the title we have it up there sleep to win how navy seals and other high performers yeah. stay on top great stuff you have incredible insight um and i really love meeting people with a medical background who also walk the walk you just yeah. you just the great combination of experience and, and book knowledge and, and application application yeah, yeah so yeah, yeah. Thank you. I, I think the uh i think the medical community has been in a bad place for a long time but it totally emulated during covid oh yeah, yeah i mean I, I don't think anybody's gonna i'm kind of embarrassed to say i'm a doctor yeah. <laughs> you know, they, like, they crushed and, their and, and i'm really not i mean i'm really a health coach that can prescribe you know because i yeah. i do lifestyle modification is really what i do and it takes about a year to do that you know so i, I, I do annual programs um but yeah it's it's uh it, it it's a shame that doctors have been so much led the way they have you know mm-hmm. uh, but it you think about who becomes a doctor it's like people who are really good at following the rules, right? Mm-hmm. Like people who are great students and do all the, they do all the things they're supposed to be doing. And that's what gets them into medical school. And then it's really hard to convince them they've been duped, you know? Yeah. And, mm-hmm. you know, and, and yeah, the pharmaceutical industry, uh, you know, I used to think this was such a big conspiracy. Boy, did COVID change my mind about a lot of yeah. stuff, you know, but, um, 
you know, all, you, you think about it, I don't think it was really intentional. Nobody thought this through, but all, all of the research dollars to the big universities come from the pharmaceutical industry. And then who's doing the research? The guys who are the medical school professors and what are they teaching, what they're doing yeah, research on. Yeah. And then when you become a doctor and they get a panel of all these guys yep. who've been doing researches at the top levels, and then they set what the standard of care is, it's based off their research and what they've taught their medical students. And now you come out of there and all you know how to do is prescribe mil, uh, pills and, and uh, procedures. And that's not health. I mean, that's disease care, right? And so, like, you know, the the biggest, well, the seals, the seal teams are the best things in my life twice. I mean, the the first time as a seal probably kept me out of prison, and then, you know, the second time made me realize the, there's a huge difference between uh, health and di health and f disease free, right? And like, this is just performance. Like, guys, guy, like, there's plenty of really healthy people that can't perform the way they want to perform. That I know things and I have the expertise to help them do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it has nothing to do with them having a disease or even it, being close to a disease. It's and not ironically, pathology. It prevents disease, right? Yeah, so and, what you do with that them, that prevents disease. Yeah. Absolutely. You're keeping them out yeah. of the systems. Yeah. Right. Well it's again, focus. Thanks again, Dr. Yeah. Parsi. This yeah, has been awesome. Pleasure. And uh, yeah. hopefully we have it back on the we'll, we'll, um if y'all want to come up, I mean, if you want to say it on here, if y'all want to come up with like a URL, we'll give that done. We'll give that thing to your guys. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, that, yeah. that sheet, they that worksheet. Yeah. Oh, for sure, hundred yeah, percent. That's, yeah. that's the easiest. I was going to ask anyway because yeah. once you said that, I know our listeners are going to want to check out that worksheet. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it, and it's uh, just forewarning. It seems ridiculously easy, but it is the most powerful thing I do. That's that's <laughs> part of the formula that women things. Things. Yeah. 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 It's, it's good yeah. timing too. We actually just we just wrote a program for forty plus, and it's the first time we wrote a program where we actually put a ton of emphasis on lifestyle, and oh, a yeah. lot of it is the stuff that you talked about. Yeah, so yeah. It's, it'll align yeah. perfect. Excellent. I love it. Right. Yeah. Thanks again. Thanks. Yep. Thank you. All right.